Yeah, yeah, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Finest United Podcast. I just want to thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone that has supported the podcast by sharing episodes, liking, and subscribing to our YouTube page at Finest United, and giving us a follow on Facebook and Instagram at Finest United as well. During our last episode, I made a bit of a mistake saying that we were getting rid of our Finest United IG. What I meant to say was that we are getting rid of our Finest United podcast IG, our Instagram. And we're going to be putting everything onto Finest United. Once again, Finest United podcast is out the window on Instagram. And everything will be on our Finest United page. Now... I want to get to business. I don't want to do too much uh, haggling because we got a very, very special guest here today. But um, today's episode is episode number 11, and it's titled Living Legend. The reason being is because that's exactly what today's guest is. Everyone that's on the job or has been on the job likes to hear the numbers speak for the cops. So let's get straight to it. He's had more than 2,000 arrests and assisted on more than 5,000 others. He made more than 100 arrests while off-duty and was involved in 15 gun battles. He collected 219 NYPD awards and 40 civilian honors, and he earned a combat cross, the department's second highest honor. He is now retired and an author of of his living testimony in the book titled Street Warrior. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the job's most decorated detective, Ralph Friedman. Thank you, Lenny. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. And uh, I think we're going to have a good show tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're definitely going to have a great show today. I want to thank you for coming on. It's my honor. My honor. (laughs) I know that retirement is probably really good right now, and for you to come on this show and and make this uh, make this move in a snowstorm, it, it's very difficult. And I really appreciate you taking the time. And well, thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. I was looking forward to coming down. This little snow wasn't going to stop me. Yeah, I hear that. You're, you're a very, very determined guy, from what it is that I've I've learned about you. <laughs> so I knew that a little bit of snow wasn't going to stop you from no. coming in today. So. Um, it's been a great time talking with you and getting things ready for the episode. I had to hold back while talking to you on the phone <laughs> about some things because it's like I, I want to save so much of the conversations that we've had for the listeners so they I'm, can just I'm, hear. We're going to cover everything. We're gonna, <laughs> well, we're going to try to cover everything, but I'm sure we're going to cover a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know we will. And, you know, with us talking on the side, everything flowed well, and I just want to bring that same the same feel to this podcast today, and I I'm know sure that's going to happen. Will. So, Ralph, tell us a little bit about your beginnings. Well, I was just a regular neighborhood guy. I had no family, no friends that were cops. Uh, never even thought of becoming a police officer. Or, well, in those years, they were called patrolmen. Mm. It was before there were many women on the job, and it wasn't called police officers. That was relevantly uh, new, the uh, concept. But it was called Patrolman. You were classified PTL. Okay. And uh, never thought of it. Um, I was just happened to be out with some friends on a Friday night, which I usually always went out with my friends on Friday and weekends, get home late. And uh, I always used to sit down with my pop and, uh, you know, I used to drink a quart of milk and a complete pie before I went to sleep (laughs) because I always burnt it up. I was working out all the time. Yeah. I was in great shape. I had a good job. I was moving furniture. Okay. And uh, I was out with some guys, and they just said to me, I said, what are you doing tomorrow? And I didn't mean early in the morning. But they said, uh, we're taking the police test. I said, you're kidding me. I couldn't believe it. And in those years, it was a walk on, walk-in test. No prior filing. And they were giving it in my uh, the high school that I graduated, Dewitt really? Clinton. Okay. And you could just walk in. There was no filing. And uh, I, I said, you know what? Knock on my door. If uh, if I get up, I'll go. Otherwise, yeah. I wasn't even thinking of it. I was making a lot of money. I was making four dollars and fifty cents an hour. The rest of the state, New York State, was making a dollar fifteen an hour, no and they had to work forty hours a week to start overtime. And the job I had, you only had to work eight hours a day. And if you worked two more hours, you got overtime, even if you didn't work any more hours that week. 
So I was doing great. I was the first of my friends to get a car. You know, it was all cool and stuff. And right. uh, I just happened to wake up and went with them. Once I took the test, then I started to think about it. I said, man, you know, maybe this is a great job. Yeah. You know, uh, some way I could advance without college because I didn't want to go to college. Okay. You know, I wanted to get into the into the street and work and make a life for myself. Right. You know, I was gung-ho about that. Yeah. And I just thought about being on my own. So my father did hook me up with the job. And uh, when I say the job, I meant the moving job yeah. that I was doing well on. But then I thought, you know, I'm going to be lifting the same furniture 20 years later. You know, nothing was going to change. Absolutely. I'm going to be lifting this uh, refrigerator or couch on day one and then 20 years later, which wasn't bad because I was into working out and lifting. So. Yeah. But I said, you know, maybe with the police I could get a career and move up without, uh, without college. Okay. And so once I took the test, I was excited about it. Right. And I wound up getting called relatively fast. I got called like uh, – like eight months later, and I was too young. So they offered me a trainee job. It was a police trainee. Okay. So you're you're working for the New York City. You're yeah. working for the police department. Okay. But you're working indoors, and you, uh, you only did indoor things. Okay. And I was really actually hired as a fingerprint technician. I went to the police academy to learn how to do fingerprinting because they passed a law then that in New York City you had to register firearms, long arms. Okay. So everybody was coming into the precinct voluntarily, into any precinct in the city, right. and registering their long arms and rifles and shotguns and getting fingerprinted. And everyone was being approved. They just wanted to know who had the long arms. Right. So I was assigned to the 44th precinct in the Bronx, and I worked there for uh, – Six months doing that, and then all of a sudden they invented nine one one. So nine one one wasn't invented yet. No, not when I came on the job. Uh, used to have to call a seven digit number, and in the Bronx, uh, the communications was broken up to each borough. And in the Bronx, it was actually in a garage in the back of the four six precinct on Ryer Avenue. That was the Bronx Communication Center. Oh wow! So they invented this thing nine one one, and it was going to be placed out of uh, police headquarters. So this is, that's, that's a New York thing. 911 yeah. is... Oh, yeah. Every city has their own. Now it's so sophisticated. Now if you dial 911 on your cell phone, it'll be picked up by the airwaves wherever you are located. Right. Uh, back then, it wasn't... No one had 911. Wow. It wasn't crazy. invented until June of 1968. That's and crazy. I went there right from yeah. the beginning. And it was pretty – well, now it was, it was very advanced for the time. Right. If you look at it now, what we had, it was very antiquated. Sure, sure. You know, you used to work there. You sat in these, on these long tables and they were uh, conveyor belts. You would take the call and you would uh, write it on a slip of paper. It looked like even like a punch-in time slip. It was like a, that rectangle uh, cardboard. Okay. You'd write the job, what, it, what the job was. <laughs> And the location. And then you would put it on a conveyor belt. They had five conveyor, five holes on the conveyor belt. Okay. And you put it in the borough of where they called. And it would be transferred into a room like this, which was the dispatcher's room. And then they would call the radio car. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, and I did that on the belt for quite a while. And then I got like what they called the promotion. I went to what they call the action desk. Okay. And what it was was I would get the results from – a heavy job, if it was a, an officer shot or a bank robbery or a person shot or a bomb scare, those were considered heavy things. Right. And I would get the results, the disposition from the dispatcher and let the boss know. Okay. So I was a go-between between the bosses and the dispatcher getting the results of heavy radio runs. Wow. And I spent a year and a half there until I turned 21. Okay. And right before I turned 21 – uh, they put me in the class, in the academy, right. so I could get the gun training and learn all the laws and the physical fitness thing and be a graduate, which I did in April of 1970. Uh, and then I went to the 41st Precinct. Okay. So at no point did, was there a time where you only had to be 18 to get on the job? It was always 21? We were always 21. During okay. the years much, much later, I'm talking decades later, sure. there was a time they lowered it to 20, then they brought it back to 21, then they lowered it to 20 again. Okay. But um, 
it was a little. There was a, a lot of touchy uh, laws back then. With you know, they they couldn't drink and you couldn't uh, carry a firearm under twenty one. Sure, right. There was a lot of adjustments that were made, but they lowered and raised the age a couple of times over the. But when I came on during the, when it was the sixties and seventies, you had to be twenty one. Okay. And you did inside work, and the program they had then, because there was a couple of programs over the years, but my program was a police trainee. Over the years later, a few years later, they had a cadet program where you had to go to, they gave you um, money to go to college. Right. And you had to do, you still had to do a certain amount of years okay. and stuff. But I, I didn't have anything to do that. I was a straight trainee. We wore gray uniforms. We okay. did everything a police officer would do indoors. Right. You know, it was TS, working okay. the switchboard, sure. uh, 124 work, taking the complaints, filing, just stuff like that. Right. Okay. Okay. And what borough did you grow up in? I grew up in the Bronx. I was born in the Bronx. I was raised in the Bronx. I gra- went to Bronx High School. All school, all my schooling was in the Bronx. Graduated. graduated. And, and then my police career, career was in the Bronx, except for that time when I went to communications, which was in Manhattan. It was in the old police headquarters. Police headquarters was 240 Center Street. Wow. And I think it was just around 1970 that they built one, one PP. Okay. So uh, I was in the old headquarters, which was 240 Center Street. It's now a, a condo or a co-op building. Wow. Okay. Okay. So when you growing up in the Bronx, now you go through the academy. Actually, let's, let's talk about what the academy was like for you. Uh, the academy was – I loved it. I loved the physical part of it. Okay. You know, nobody likes the classroom, but, you know, it comes with the territory. You got to learn the laws and procedures. Right. Um, we did like uh, four hours of class, and we did three hours of gym and then an hour lunch break. Okay. But uh, we always started out with the gym, which I loved. I was in great shape, the best shape of my life then. You know, um, here I am, 21 years old, 20, 21, and I've been working out since I'm 12. Okay. You know, and I, I, I ate it up. You yeah, know, it was yeah. great. Um, there was nothing for you. And your, the academy, they had, there was only eight to four. You know, there was no other was hours. One, one session. It that like was it. You know, now they tour. have uh, different shifts on the academy. Yeah. But we did eight to fours. It was Monday to Friday. You had to travel into Manhattan, and they had certain rules that you couldn't break, which I guess I could admit now I broke. <laughs> but the statute of limitations ran out. You know? But uh, you weren't allowed to drive to work. They wanted you in uniform, taking public transportation. So you were a presence, even though you had no gun. You, they saw you had a bag, big bag, that you carried your stuff in, and you had a nightstick. But uh, they didn't want you, car- you couldn't carry a gun, but they wanted you unarmed in the trains as a presence. But okay. you were really like a target. Ah. And you weren't allowed out uh, during the week or weekends, even weekends when you were off. You were never allowed to be out of your house after midnight. It was called the Cinderella Law. And what was that about? Just so you wouldn't get Just in so trouble? Just so you wouldn't get in trouble and stuff. You know, they didn't want you out drinking. They didn't want you out uh, drag racing. They didn't want you out <laughs> bars. And yeah. They, they just didn't want – it was just a rule. Right. It was called the Cinderella Rule. Okay. And you weren't allowed out. You know, and, uh, you know, they did very big background checks then. You know, it was very different. They used to go to your – everywhere you worked as a kid – they go to your teachers. They go to your neighbors. They if you, maybe made a big deal. I had like a, I had a couple of moving violations. They drove you nuts, and even if you had a parking ticket. Wow. Today it's so different. Now I know they brag, the city and the police department brag a lot about the diversity of the police department today. Yeah. And I, I don't see it because because. People are coming on. They brag that they had people come on from like 162 countries or something. Right. You know, and in some of these countries, you can't verify. Uh, there's no records. And, you know, they don't go. And obviously, they're not sending guys all over the world to go to your neighbor's house. You know, I, I just think that there's probably a few people on the job today that weren't investigated like we were back then. Right, right. <clears throat> you know, plus over the years, I know for a fact that they've lowered the standards that if you got arrested for a felony and it was uh, dropped or you weren't convicted of a felony, if they dropped, you could get on the job. And, uh, I, I, you know, I might uh, stir some feathers with this, but I just don't agree with that stuff. I okay. feel that um, there has to be standards. And over the course of years, you raise standards if you want better policing. Right. You know, not that some of these guys didn't work out. I'm not going to say that. Sure. 
But I just think that you have to have standards. Okay. You know, you don't want a guy who didn't uh, get the proper training or something like that operating on you. You go sure. to a hospital, you want the best doctor you can to operate Very on true. you. Very true. So you want the best police officer to respond when you need help. Absolutely. You know, people are calling you. Um, for very serious things. Right. It's a big responsibility being a police officer in any town or city. You know, it's always been dangerous and serious work. Right. And uh, I just take it seriously, and I believe that the standards should be upheld. So back then it was a lot t- <clears throat> Do you feel it was a lot tougher to get in because of Oh, the- it was very tough. Okay. If you had a felony, there was no chance in the world you were getting on. No wow. possibility. Wow. Yeah, I don't even think you would have got on with a convicted uh, misdemeanor. Okay. I mean, I remember what they put guys through for parking tickets. Really? And even if your na- forget about even parking, even if your neighbors happen to speak bad about you, they wouldn't take you. Right. And that's that's kind of how things are when you go to these other agencies, like say state troopers or other counties and sorts. Well, you know, yeah, but yeah, smaller counties and state police and stuff like that. They still upheld uh, their standards higher. Uh, it's the inner cities, the major cities. You know, which are much bigger departments, I right. understand that. And you do need manning. Right. And like I said, I'm sure plenty of them turned out great. Right. You know, I'm not putting everybody down who didn't uh, came from another country or something. I no, I understand what you're saying. I'm saying, but standards, they should come here like they did. And they should work on raising their profile to be meet the standards that have to be met. So I know for, I had friends that came from other places. Right. And, they went to college or they did physical fitness or they learned laws, and they, they raised their standards to come up to meet the police department. I don't believe the police departments should come down to meet someone else's standards. That's understandable. You should, it should be the same in any uh, profession. Absolutely. You Absolutely. know, you want the best to do any job. You're not going to hire the worst accountant, the worst doctor, you know, the worst, you, what do you, go out looking for the worst mechanic? You know, <laughs> right. you, you want to have the best of the best. Uh, yeah, and I believe you. that... Anyone who wants to become a cop should uh, do their homework and raise their personal standards to meet the department standards. That's a good point. That's a good point. So let me ask you this. Do you feel like I kind of get this. I kind of have this feeling that being a police officer back then was kind of like being a rock star. I kind of feel that it was something. I would say no. I mean. I mean, people. There was more respect and yeah. fear for you. Yeah, I'll tell you that. If you saw a cop walking down the street, you crossed the street, even if you didn't do anything wrong. Right. You know what I mean? Which I think we need today. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think things are out of control in <clears throat> the major cities. But I think more. I would consider it more like it was a paramilitary outfit, and I think it was more like towards the military. There were standards, and you respected rank. Uh, you know, a sergeant was like a god. Mm. A captain, I can't even describe. You know what I mean? Do you know when I was on the job and I was in the four when I got there? Do you know like we'll take like uh, Con Ed? Okay. They couldn't even come into your precinct and open a manhole without going in and getting permission from the sergeant or letting them know <clears throat> what's going on. Yeah. They did. It's just everyone had to check in. Right. You know, if a uh, uh, telephone repair was doing stuff, Con Ed, I remember distinctly. They had to check in and get an okay from the sergeant. Right. Or that the sergeant knew what was going on in his precinct. Nothing went down without supervisors knowing what's going on. Okay. And I, I think it was ran very military style. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it was just, I think it was better. Okay. Do you feel <clears throat> that there was a, a bigger pool to choose from? Whereas, and, and what I mean by that is being that, Maybe a lot of people wanted to become police officers. You had more people go through the process where the academy could say, all right, we could push these 1,000, 2,000 people to the side and only pick the creme de la creme. Whereas now I feel that people don't want the job as much. Well, in my time, I would say people didn't want the job as much either. Okay. Um, There was a time later on. <clears throat> like in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s where people did want to become police officers. Okay, so that's the era I'm thinking of. In my time in the 70s, six, the late 60s and 70s, a lot of guys came back from Vietnam and became police officers. Um, but the public itself wasn't wild about it because there was a lot of bad headlines about – I came on during the NAP Commission, which was a big thing on police corruption. 
Right. And also the BLA was around, called the Black Liberation Army. Yes. And they were killing cops. So, I mean, it was a very dangerous job then. And then with the corruption, it, it wasn't a good image at the time. And then the danger was put out to the public all the time because they were targeting police at the time. The Black Liberation Army was a terrorist group. It was an offshoot of the Panthers. And they were targeting. They didn't just go out and kill cops. They wanted to kill black and white cops. They wanted what they called salt and pepper teams. Oh, really? Oh, they specifically targeted them. If you go back and look at the I guys have heard that, were, of that it was a, always a black and white team. Right. And uh, the public got a lot of it, it got a lot of press, and the public was aware of it. That it, it was a very dangerous job. I think they had a hard time getting recruits, but they still upheld the standards. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the police department got, when I was on, it did hit a, a peak of a, a amount of officers. We had a 38,000-man force, which I think was a very big. I think that was one of the biggest. I think at some point during the 2000s, it went up near there. But then they've been backing off. And I know now that retirements are up. and uh, Big time. Big time. Yeah. I mean, it's up like a couple of hundred percent. Crazy since last year. Well, you know, because of what's going on yeah. in the, uh, with the laws they pass and the politicians and hierarchy not uh, backing police officers, I think that's changed recruitment and it's lowering the uh, stats of the department because retirements are so high. Okay. So just so that people kind of have an idea what era it was or when you came out, what year was that? Well, I came on as a trainee in 19, January of 1968, which I did almost two years to the day. I think it was, it was just about two, it might have been short of one or two days, of two years as a trainee. Yeah. And then I got appointed February 2nd of 1970. Wow. So we're talking, I started 53 years ago. <laughs> I mean, uh, obviously, in right. any time frame, things change in that kind of period. Things okay. change in, well, we see now how a, a complete city and state changed in one year. Right. You know, with the uh, policies and agendas that are out there, plus the pandemic. We see how things change so fast. Uh, so you obviously in 53 years, a lot of things have changed. Right, right. I you think know. one of the things that's most memorable, especially when coming out of the academy, is your first arrest. Can yeah. you still remember yours? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I write about it in my book, Street Warrior. Um, the first thing, I didn't even know if it was an arrest or not, but I knew it was wrong. I, I leave the station house. Now, you got to understand, the 4-1, when I got assigned there, was the busiest house in the country. Fort Apache, right? Fort Apache, yeah. the 41st Precinct. Uh, the numbers were staggering. It was things you didn't believe. But uh, it was very violent. And we had 425 police officers assigned there. Nice. Plus, on the third floor, we had 200 TPF officers. Now, that was a special unit. It was called the Tactical Patrol Force. Okay, so... and. It, it, it was crazy. They, these guys were the, uh, the best of the best. And they would put, if they had a problem area, they put 20 of them on the corner. So, and they were what they called the hats and bat guys. Okay, so they had the shields, they had the they, hats, they, they had the bats. Yeah, they, I mean, they just, you, no one did operate when they came by. Okay. You know, and they had to be six foot. There was no doubt about it. You had to be six foot to get on oh, the, so they meant business. They, they were totally business. They bust them all over the city. And they worked out a couple of different precincts, but we had 200 assigned to our command. So that's 625 guys right there. That says a lot about that command. You know, plus, you had borough units, you had borough burglary, burglar, bur borough narcotics. They would always be on our precinct because that was where the most action was. Okay. So anyway, I leave the precinct and, you know, you have to come in in uniform, you know, change in your car or come in in uniform because it took you months to get a locker. Really? Yes. So the guys, know, the guys that had time guys, on? They took two or three lockers, and they never gave him up, you know? Right, right. So, you know, you're working out of your car, right? So I come in, I check in at the desk, and, you know, they give you a post, which you don't even know where it is. You get a map, but you got to find it. You're on your own. There's no uh, field training. There's no NSU, no uh, seasoned guy showing the rookies what to do. You just get sent out there. Yeah. You know, you got your... Uh, your, uh, your, your wits about you, you got a gun and a shield and a nightstick, and you got only what your, you know, your, your guts and your training. So your nobody got work. in you, no field intelligence? Or I walked, the, no, nothing. No one trains you, you know. You know, they give you a little speech in front of the desk, and that's it. You're on your own. Right. 
You know, nobody takes your hand. You know, so I walk down the block. You know, I'm one block away from the precinct. I see this really loud crowd. I mean, they're screaming and uh, all kinds of stuff, and I, I couldn't even see what was in the middle. So I work my way in, and there's a guy dancing on the street, absolutely bull's ass naked. <laughs> You know, now I know it's wrong. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't like, think it's public uh, nudity or indecent exposure or something. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, you don't know what to do. You know, you're a rookie. You, yeah, you know? yeah. I cuff him up and I start leading them back to the precinct. And it was just like the change of the precinct because I just walked out. So now I got all these cops in front, you know, making jokes and cheering. And, <laughs> you know, the pool is that way, kid. Or I think you took strip searching a little too far. You know, or a pat down too far. Yeah. You know, and then, you know I'm getting all this. They wound up, I get to the desk, and uh, it wasn't an arrest. They wound up, they psychoed him. Okay. You know, we, that's another thing that changed. Today it's EDP. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, but today, I mean, back then the word was you got a psycho on your hands. You go and taking him to the hospital to see a psychiatrist. Okay. And then they tell you basically that he's normal and you're nuts for bringing him in. You know? So, <laughs> that's and that's great. what rookies did. We sat with psychos and DOAs. Yeah. You know, they used to snatch you up. Say, okay, kid, get in the car. You go into the hospital or to an apartment where a DOA is. So and you sit there with him. That's very interesting. So, without you having a field training officer to go out there with you, no, nah, nothing. And you growing up in the Bronx, do you feel that you having the uh, the roots of living in the Bronx helped you with being a police officer in the Bronx? It's funny you say that because I thought the same thing. I, I was happy to go to the 4 4, I mean the 4 1. Yeah. I was happy to go there because I had a reputation. Right. And I said, you know, listen, if I'm going to be a cop, I want to be in the major league. I was in the major league as the NYPD. Yeah. But I want to go to a precinct where. There's action, you know. Got you. And I grew up in the Bronx, and this is just a couple of miles from my house. And the funny thing is, I wasn't prepared for it. No. But I, nah, nah. You know, I grew up in a really Jewish, Italian, Irish neighborhood. What area was that? It was a Kingsbridge Road, Fordham, Kingsbridge area of okay. the Bronx. Okay. You know, sort of like the North Bronx. Gotcha. You. you know, and I'm just a couple of miles away from this area. And I, I had no clue to what I was getting into. Night and day, huh? You know, it was all uh, black and Hispanic, yeah. which I really didn't deal with then. Okay. And then the drugs and the disregard for human life. I, I didn't realize a couple of miles away, it was like being on another planet That's or maybe amazing. another universe. Wow. You know, it was still all the Bronx, but I wasn't exposed to that stuff. Really? You know, I th and, you know, I was in good shape, though, and I thought I could handle things, which I did handle, but... It, it, my brain wasn't ready to accept all this stuff. It was really uh, like just being somewhere else. I mean, I thought I was in another country. Wow. So let me ask you this. with Once again, with you not having that training, do you feel that it allowed for, back then, it allowed for more margin of error for you to kind of figure out what needed to be done and not be disciplined as much? Well, they make you disciplined. Yes. I mean, the department is very, you know, you know, we have a, re a reputation of it being a Wild West and that you, they, everyone looks at the things I've done and what other police officers have done as being a Wild West show. And yeah, it was, right. It was really, I mean, there was a lot of crime and stuff, but you were always checked. You know, they had shooting teams. They had FIAU, which is an offshoot of IAD. Okay. They had the DA's office. They had the precinct bosses. You, you were really you were being checked. There was a real... Uh, a sense of rank and that supervision. Okay. But they did give you a little more leeway. Mm -hmm. um, they felt you were more like grown-ups. Okay. You know, that you did a, a graduate the four-month police academy, which I know now is six months, and they have psychological training. We had nothing like that, you know, like psychological training. If you made it through your investigation, uh, the investigators thought you were psychologically well enough to perform. Okay. And... Um, that, the four months of training, and like I say, sergeants were guards. They were on top of you as far as if you needed them for something. And when you came in with an arrest or a situation, uh, they would help you. It was a very close, very tight-knit, a lot of camaraderie. And uh, you, you, we didn't have radios. No. You were on your own. No, we didn't have radios. We had a thing that was called a ring. And uh, some officers that I still talk to say, some uh, roll calls still have it on the roll call when you go to check. And they never knew what it was until I told them. There's a little minute number 
near your name. Very minute. I don't know if they still have it today, but even like up to like five years ago, I know mm. they had it and some commands. And it was a number from 1 to 59. Okay. That number is your ring. And that means that, let's say your number is 15, <laughs> right? That means every, uh, every, when it's 15 minutes after every hour, you had to go to a call box or a phone and call into the precinct, to the TS, and let them know this is Officer Friedman, I'm still alive. From a pay phone. Well, they used to have what's called pay bo- pay uh, uh, call boxes. It was a police phone. You open a little box. I mean, today everything's destroyed, even pay phones. Yeah. You know, everything's gone. But they had a, but a call box. It was green. It says NYPD on it. And you would open wow. it up and pick up a hard set and say, this is Officer Freeman. But you call whatever that ring number is. So everyone had a minute from 1 to 59. And the TS would just check it off that you're on post and you're alive. That Amazing. was your wellness check. Amazing. You so know? you, I mean, you had that. Edge. A little later on, uh, radios came out. Okay. That was a big deal. Right. But they didn't hardly work, especially if you went into the subway. Wow. You know, because they didn't, you know, we had uh, transit was later on, but you would mm-hmm. go in with transit anyway to back them up. Okay. But we, it was even before, I think, I don't even know what year transit started. But I remember going in the subways all the time and housing. And uh, you didn't get, re- you know, you go into buildings and stuff. Well, in the 4 1, we didn't have. Um, high rises. We didn't have uh, uh, the big tenements, but we had uh, walk up buildings. They were five and six stories. Sure. And uh, you didn't get reception, or the radios didn't work good because they were new and they didn't work underground. And right. I think transit to this day still complains about <laughs> radios yeah. you know, not working that well. Yeah. You know, with all steel down there and the noise of the trains. But uh, it was a different time. And, you know, I tell you, really, to tell you a funny thing, we used to go to the range. And you would fire, right? This is in the Bronx. Yeah, okay. Rodman's Neck. And later on, when they, they say, we're going to upgrade the range, it's going to be high tech now. You know what high tech was? What they was brought that? in an abandoned car, uh, a hot fire hydrant, <laughs> and a parking meter. And you would place yourself behind there. Okay. That's high tech. You know, and we used to, you see, now you got cover. And, you know, you know we didn't have silhouette, you know, the, the moving targets. Right, 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 right. You know, uh, uh, there was no no computers were invented okay, then. Yeah. There were no cell phones invented then. Of we not. were even before beepers. Right. I mean, it was just a, such a different age. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur, man. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> so let me ask you: Would you, with them not having radios, and once again, would it be in such a tough time, especially with the violence? I mean, what in 1973 there were 1,100 murders, 1,300 rapes, 13,000 robberies, 19,000 assaults. Is that what kind of made the camaraderie so so strong? The fact that you had to depend on each other yeah, through these uh, violent the, times uh, and not having the police department was very is a very was I don't know how today it's not as much, but it was always a very tight knit. Uh, you know, the guys would take me under their wing. You know, they watch out for you. I mean, they weren't with you, but they'd come by. You need some coffee. You need water. You know, well, it wasn't water. That wasn't invented yet. <laughs> bottle bottle water. water, yeah, get you know, that out of here. They always offered you coffee. Yeah. But I, I never drank coffee. Okay. I still to this day never had yeah, coffee yeah. in my life. Really? Yeah, never had coffee in my life or soda or tea. I was always, uh, I drank a lot of milk at the time, or orange juice, now like Gatorade or oh, something like man. that. I, I don't drink, uh, I don't drink, I never did, uh, I never smoked, I never drank, never do drugs. You know, I, I contribute that to saving my life. In my accident, because I recovered quickly, and I, I never get awesome, sick. Man. I never. I'm 72 years old, and I don't even have a doctor. Wow! Wow! You know what I mean, I don't get sick. I've never missed a day's work for be, being sick. I only miss work due to line of duty injuries. You know, but uh, you know, if I didn't feel good, I'm not saying I never felt good. But I lay down before work, and then lay down after work. But I never miss work. That's amazing. You know, but you know when you have. Uh, Broken bones, I had to miss work. You know, right. I broke my hands three times, broke fractured skull twice. I can't tell you how many fingers and toes I broke in fights, mm. you know. But I, I've always had injuries that left me out of work. But I'd get back. I once had this one injury, right? I was in uniform, and uh, I got I broke my hand when I was off duty in a fight making an off-duty arrest. Well, tell me about that. Oh, man, I was home in my apartment working out. 
right? I'm listening to music. I'm working out. And I get a phone call at my house because we didn't have cells then. Yeah. But I was home, and my girlfriend calls me at the time <laughs> and tells me she's like two miles away, and there's two guys harassing her and her mother and throwing her mother on the floor of a store. Oh, man. You know, uh, so, you know, I stopped what I was doing. I jump in my car. I race up there. There's a big crowd. <clears throat> and uh, they tell me uh, the guy's just left in a truck, you know, okay. and they're driving down the block in a moving truck. Right. So I pull over the truck right outside of uh, Montefiore Hospital. Okay. And there's some, some significance to that, which I'll come to. But I pull him over, and they get out of the truck. It, was a, it happened to be, which we learned later, two brothers. Uh, one was like uh, 15, I think, 14 or 15. The other was like uh, 25. They get out of this moving truck, right? And I come over, I tell them I'm a police officer. And right away, they had, both of them had tire irons in their hands. You know, and I never shot anybody before. This is going to be my first shooting. Oh. Right? So I'm in the street. Now I back up between double park cars on Gun Hill Road, and I back up, and they're swinging at me. With the tire two, irons. With two tire irons. And I just keep backing up, and I got a gun pointed at them, and they're coming on to me. Later found out they were drinking. They had empty vo- uh, vodka bottles on the floor of the truck and yeah. stuff. So finally the guy gets up close enough to me, and he swings right at my head, and I go to block it. So I put my hand up like this with my gun hand, and the guy crashes my hand, right? I didn't know it at the time, but my hand breaks. But I don't drop my gun. But he broke my hand. The adrenaline. Right? And I knew the other guy ran up behind me, right? So I, I go to turn around, but it's too late. The guy smashes me across the head, and my eyes fill with blood. I can't see now. So when I turn around, my gun stops, Right? And I just fired because I figured I gotta be it gotta be his body. There's no one else close to me. Yeah. I wound up I put four holes in him with one bullet. Right? Wow. So the gun was pressed against his throat. Oh, so I fired. Wow. And I, the bullet goes in his neck, comes out his neck, goes in his shoulder, and comes out his shoulder. But he's okay, believe it or not. He wanted to, he survived. <laughs> Always. Then, That's then how I, it always works. Yeah, we always used to say a cop gets shot in the toe, he dies. Exactly. Perp gets shot seven times in the chest and lives. Still said. Still said, right? <laughs> so I turn around again. Now I still can't see, but I know the other guy is going to be in front of me. But I can barely see. Now I'm wiping the blood out of my eyes and turn around, and the pipe is coming right down on my head again. And before I can pull the trigger, a hand comes in front of my face and blocks it. And it was a police officer sent by people that called uh, 911. That's amazing. And, you know, my girlfriend described me because I didn't look like a cop at the time. Yeah. And uh, she called, described me, and they blocked the uh, thing. And we all wound up in the hospital that we were in front of. That guy, you know, took a beating. Uh, the other guy got shot, and I wind up with a fractured skull and a broken hand. So I leave the hospital that night. I left. I left it with a turban. You know, what do you call it? Party hat? Bronze party hat I wound up with. Right? <laughs> and, a, and a cast up to my elbow for a broken hand. Man. And uh, uh, the guy who got shot was admitted. We're all in the hospital for about 15 hours. In the same hospital? In the same hospital, Montefiore, right outside Montefiore. That's amazing, you know? man. But uh, that was my first shooting. And I gave these guys all the space. You know, I was backing up, backing up, telling them. There was 100 witnesses that saw this. Right. And it was t- uh, two guys. They had two brothers, and they were drunk, and they didn't give a shit. They wanted to bash my head in. So your first shooting was actually off duty. off duty. How, many t- how much time did you have on at that time? Uh, I think I had about a year. Really? Yeah, and then that was going back to where this story started, Yeah. <clears throat> I go back to work. You know, I just get out of the cast, I get go to therapy, and uh, I get back to work. And the guys knew I had a broken hand and everything. Everyone knew me. So I get back to work, and we get a burglary run, right? And uh, they say, okay, Ralph, you take the back. We're going to go in the front. No, they say, you stay in front. They're going to go to the back, right? So I said, okay, because they figured, you know, the burglar's gonna, the burglar's going to come out the back, you know, wherever he broke in the roof, go out the back, whatever, mm-hmm. or a back door. No one's going to come out the front. Right. So I'm in the front by myself. Everybody runs to the back. And there the guy comes out, comes off the roof, lands on the uh, awning. It was a taxpayer roof, one story high. Okay. He jumps from the roof onto the uh, awning and then bounces right in front of me. <laughs> 
right? So I punch <laughs> him right in the face, knock him out. Yeah. And uh, my, the guys come back around, and I tell my partner, you better take me right to the hospital. I feel my, I broke my hand. I feel it blowing up. Just starts swelling up. Same hand, same bone. And there I am back in a cast again. Unreal. Unreal. You know? Man. So let me ask you this. Is there... Is there a job or is there a... That was 1971, that show. That was 1971. 71. Okay. All right. So is there, is there anything, with you being retired now, that plays in your head regularly? Is there one incident, one job, or one circumstance that you've gone through in your career that, I don't want to say haunts you, but plays through your head regularly and makes you... Well, one of the... One of the incidents, one, I mean, there's a lot of incidents. I have a lot, I've been involved in a lot of things and a lot of shootings. Um, you know, I've been involved in like 13 shootings and two other shootings that were dogs. You know, it was really 15 shooting incidents, but really two were with dogs, yeah. which I had no choice when I was a dog person myself. Right. But one incident that I, I always think about, one of the main incidents, was an incident where I was in anti-crime and I had to go to court. So I was, came back from court, it was around 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and the boss teamed me up with another officer who was in my unit, was a friend of mine, but we weren't direct the partners. So he put us out together in his private car, uh, my partner's private car, the guy I was working with that day, and it was 2 in the afternoon, and we got a, we, we as anti-crime don't pick up burg- or radio runs. Right. But we pick them up as backups, you know, because we always, you know, it was tight-knit, like I said. Mm-hmm. And if they go into a heavy job, we're certainly going to back up another officer. Right. So we got a job for us, burglary. And it also said a girl screaming. So we picked it up as a, a backup. Because a burglary is usually, 99% of the time, a past job. But this with a girl screaming attached to it, to it is like a burglary in progress. So we picked it up, and we just happened to get there before the radio car. And being it was a girl, a civilian calling for help, we proceeded up to the apartment because, you know, you're not going to make a civilian wait when it's an emergency call. Of course not. So we go up there and we see the door. It was on the top floor, of course. And we saw the door was uh, broken into. The door was open like five, six inches, and it was damaged to the frame where the lock is. So we knew something was going on. And we heard the screaming. So we rushed in. It was 2 in the afternoon, and it was pitch black. I mean, you couldn't see nothing. You know, they, they had shades and they had sheets and bed sheets and blankets on the windows. Couldn't see nothing. Yeah. So we go in. We didn't know where we were. We have our guns out and we're saying police. We hear screaming from the back and we sort of entered like a uh, like a uh, like a like a living room area. And we were, couldn't really see anything. We didn't yeah. know. We heard the screaming coming from the rear and we started going side by side towards this rear. Right. And all of a sudden, a male jumped out from the back, which it sort of lit up the place because when he jumped out, immediately started firing a gun at us. And we opened up immediately. And in the corner of my eye, to my left, I saw my partner who who started going down. I knew he got hit right away. And he was firing, and I'm firing. And we wind up firing like 18 rounds. Wow. And it was in a small hallway that led... Straight ahead was a bathroom, and off to the right was this bedroom where this guy jumped out of okay. where he was beating this girl. And uh, it was like a strobe light effect, like you're in a club because yeah. all the bullets were ricocheting, and the muzzle flash was strobe lighting the area. Right. And we later found out, and everything, he was only three feet away from us, and the gun battle that ensued kept getting closer to the point where he tried to run past me, and all I did was grab him. And I didn't even know he didn't have a shirt on at the time, but I grabbed him by his trap, you know, up by his shoulder. Right. And I, I was able to dig my hand into there, and he had his gun in his hand, and my gun was in my He ran, pressed into me, and I fired and killed him right there. Man. But, you know, in a lot of shootings that I said that I had, I wound up shooting eight perpetrators, which four of them died. And, you know, people always want to hear about this, and that's the exciting part of police work. And they all say... Well, how do you feel that you killed four people? And so, you know, the thing that people don't realize right away is the other side of the coin. You know, I did take a life. Yeah. But I saved a life. That's I right. saved two lives then. I saved maybe three lives. I saved that girl that might have been beat to death. 
That's right. I saved my partner's life because and my own life. You know, that's the other side of a coin when an officer takes a life. Absolutely. As long as he's justified, he's saving a life yeah. or maybe more than one life. Right. And that's the important part of the equation, you know. And I didn't feel bad. You know, uh, I did what I was trained to do. I did what I had to do. And I felt like I was victorious. I, I stopped this threat. If I was wrong, you know, uh, you know, every officer, if you use your weapon, if you shoot someone or you take a life, you got to prove, you got to go to the grand jury, you got to do and go to investigative That's bodies right. and prove that you were justified. That's right. And I always came out that I was justified. There were witnesses, there was evidence, there was testimony. And you have to be, you know, otherwise I would have been arrested or lost my job or went to jail. That's how it is. Even in those times, they did keep a very close watch on you. You were always investigated. You were always checked. Yeah. And you, you were drilled into you when you were allowed to use deadly physical force. Absolutely. It's a very big responsibility. Right. If you're on duty, off duty, just the responsibility of carrying a weapon, if you're a civilian or a police officer, right. is a big responsibility. What you do with that weapon, when you use that weapon, even when you don't use that weapon, when you're sleeping, you got to safeguard it. You're responsible for it 24 hours a day. Absolutely. If you're a civilian or a police officer, it has to be safeguarded even if you go away on vacation where you can't bring the gun or if you're sleeping or you're in a doctor's or you're getting surgery. You're responsible for that weapon, and it's something that's taken very seriously by all the investigative bodies and the police department. Right. You know, I used my gun, what most people would consider a lot, but I also made an extraordinary amount of arrests and I was exposed to violent criminals who wanted to hurt you or kill you or didn't want their freedom taken away. Okay. You know? So you had a lot of confidence. It didn't matter how many shootings that you were in. You had enough experience and you knew within yourself and were trained well enough to the point where when you were placed in danger, there was no hesitation and there was no fear in knowing no, yeah, I was be. I was always in proactive units. The four one anti crime. When well, being in the four one is like being proactive alone. When you're in what they call an a house <laughs> or a shit house, yeah. you know, and each borough has them. Right. You know, you know, you got to be on your toes. I took the job very seriously. I'm the kind of guy that takes things seriously, and I happened to work with officers that did the same. Uh, I as I made a lot of arrests and I worked my way into the four one anti crime. Uh, these guys were serious guys. They were very proactive, willing to put their lives on the line and get the job done. And we dealt with violent criminals. Now, let me ask you this. Now, this is something that a lot of people on the job talk about now. I find that a lot of people are kind of disgruntled at the fact that guys that don't have a lot of time on are making their way into anti-crime under five years. Me, personally, I think that every police officer is different. I don't judge. Back then, what was it like? Well, um, they were young guys. Well, first of all, anti-crime is usually made up of young guys. Uh, I made it in like about a little less than a year and a half. Okay. But um, they did pick by, uh, it wasn't like who you knew. You had to have a good arrest record. You had to show that you were, uh, we had 20 guys in our unit. And I'll say every one of them was a real sharp guy. Solid. Okay. Pro, they were solid, uh, proactive, gung-ho and uh, we had, you know, we had immediate supervisors that kept the tab. And uh, you had to bring in quality arrests. You know, you didn't respond to radio runs. You had to be on the ball, follow leads. You know, they came up with a word later on, which wasn't invented in my time, but they called profiling. You know, we profiled, but profiled criminals. Yeah. You know, today they make it a racial thing. Yeah. Which is, you know... You know, if you work in an all-black precinct, what choice you have? You know, you're going to well, lock up black people. I locked up and I've shot black, white, Hispanic. You know, I'm, you know, it just works out that way. It was more diverse back then in the Bronx, right? It was. No, it wasn't diverse, but you, you, you profiled criminals. You followed suspicious people. If there was a white guy in the 4-1 at a certain time, you knew that he, he would be suspicious. I'd be profiling him. Got you. You know, yeah. but we profiled suspicious people, criminals, drug locations. You know, today they just make it a racial thing, which, I, you know, I didn't see that in the police department. People ask me if they were, uh, you know, was it, was it things against me because I was Jewish. Right. But I didn't find it. You know, and, and I was able to carry myself, right. and I was there to do a job, and they respected me. 
I, I didn't see that. I worked with black guys. No, I didn't see any racial profiling. Honestly, I feel the same Stuff like that. I feel the same way. I didn't see it. I feel that whenever these incidents and cir- unfortunate circumstances happen, that's the first thing that people go back to. Certain races are being profiled, and police officers are racist. I, myself, have never dealt with any colleagues. I didn't racist. either. And the funny thing is, I was shot at by a white cop. A cop shot at me six times. Can you, can you tell us that story? I, I like that. Well, <laughs> it was a, I was in anti-crime in the yeah. beginning, and we didn't have portable radios. Right. So me and my partner are cruising, and we're going into a, um, it was a, the Gypsy Cab Riots. Yeah. It was very big, uh, very big thing. It went on for like two, three days. I mean, 24 hours a day. Right. They were, and anyway, they were cutting out street lights. They would go in there, cut the wires. Everything was black. Why were the they rioting again? Over gypsy cabs were just starting. And they felt cops were profiling gypsy cab drivers. Okay, because they were taking money away from the medallion cabs? Well, they that were doing they? that too. Yeah. But they were also, they didn't need no licensing back then. There was no control. You right. could just say, I'm a cab. Right. A lot of these guys were criminals. They were transporting drugs. They were raping passengers. A girl would get in the car. They would rape her. Yeah. You know, uh, they had guns. They had drugs. It was, it was just, there was no control. Right. Gypsy cabs were very bad then. Okay. And actually, today, I don't even think they're good. Their only excuse is that, you know, they go into a neighborhood where uh, a, a yellow cab wouldn't go late at night. Right. You know, but yellow cabs also didn't go there. Well, it was dangerous. That's granted. But there was no fares to be had. Right. Where if you work like a midtown place, you got fares all the time. Sure. You know, you got to do what's... Uh, you know, productive, you know. Absolutely. You know, so, you know, the cab drivers were scared. They didn't go there. Plus, there was no work. But the gypsy cabs, even today, they they got Uber and Lyft. I think these guys are just screwing the yellow cabs who they buy the medallions. They were, they were worth, like, over a million dollars at one point. The medallions. Yeah. Now mm-hmm. they're worth, like, maybe two, three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> but these guys got to pay the million. Yeah. You know, but... Uh, de Blasio let cabs just drive all over the place. You know, he just took away. That's like letting uh, uh, Joe Schmo become a cop. Uh, okay, here, go do that job for free. Uh, take that. You know, there was no control, no gotcha. training, no nothing. Right. So anyway, these gypsy cab riots were really going crazy, right? We didn't have portables. And we got out of the car. And after we got out of our unmarked car, it came over the air because we had a hardwire phone in the car. came over the air. No plainclothes units to get involved, stay out of the area. We didn't know it. We're out of the car. Ah. So I get out of the car, and TPF was in the area. They, the and six, they didn't, six foot plus guys with the yeah, shields. And, and <laughs> they, they were going crazy. They see yeah. these two white guys running around. They started they shot at me six times. This guy, I don't know who this guy was. He probably never knew he shot at a cop. And to this day, you know, thank God he was a bad shot and I was a fast runner. What you made know, him shoot? I don't know. They were just, it was there were shots being fired. He didn't know if shots were being fired at him from somewhere else. People were shooting off the roofs, out windows. I made it to a building. Me and my partner ran into different buildings. We hooked up on the roof, and we recovered that night like close to seventy five bombs. Wow! They were all up there already. Bricks were stashed, Molotov cocktails. We brought them into the priest. They were all bottles with gas with fuses on them. So we made it up to that roof so the perps couldn't get up there. They would have firebombed these cops. They were going to blow up radio cars from the roof. They didn't do it as brazen as today, right. being right next to the cop in the yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. You know, they used to do it from a roof. We used to call it airmail. And they still do. Yeah, but today they'll also do it <laughs> on the floor do. next to you. Yeah. Because they got stand-down orders, you know. Man, that's crazy. Getting shot out by, oh, man. I just ran into the guy. Because he probably thought shots were being fired at him by of course, somebody. Of course, of course. You know, in the ghetto, people just shoot uh Shots would be fine all the time. Now you got a riot going. People are just shooting. It was Wild West. Right. So let me, you ask, you, let me ask you this. What was the morale like amongst each other? I know it was a lot of camaraderie. But the morale was good. I'm going to tell you why. What was different was bosses, and when I say bosses, I don't mean your immediate bosses. I mean a higher ep- echelon bosses and the mayor's office. They were for you. They would turn you out at the precinct and they tell you, Get bad guys off the street. Mm. They want you to go out there and get... They were very, very concerned with keeping the public safe. Store owners, civilians, uh, taxpayers, 
They, they wanted pe- decent people. And there were a lot of decent people in the ghetto. There were people that worked. There were people that had houses there way before. It turned into a ghetto. And they just wouldn't move out or they didn't have the money to move. There were decent uh, brownstones and beautiful homes. And, you know, uh, they wanted them protected. You know, that was the police department's job, is to protect the citizens of the city. Right. And everyone took that thing serious, and they they wanted you to do work. You know, today, it's, I don't know, it's just nuts today. They Everything caters to the criminal. You know, you know how the Chinese have the, uh, the year of the cat, the year of the dog? <laughs> yeah. It's the year of the perp. But the yeah. year is going on. Right. Every law by the governor and the mayor is against police and against the citizens, the decent citizens. They do these bail reforms. You go to, you know what, uh, if you go to, when you have a trial, you know, it's very, very hard to convict somebody, to get 12 jurors to say the guy's guilty. Right. Then you finally get a guy convicted, and he gets a jail time, and then you have a parole board that just frees him, or the governor... uh, uh, you know, gives them pardons and uh, releases guys. Cop killers are getting out of jail. Who ever heard it? We never heard of such things. Insane. Thing. You know, it's insane. It's bad enough they don't ex- have executions. You know, uh, the electric chair we had and stuff. But now you get you get life, and what is life? Ten years, twenty years. It ain't life. These guys are they getting don't take out. It serious. Don't These take guys that killed more. multiple police officers are getting off the street. Right. Get them, I mean, getting off the jail. You get them off the street, and they put them back out. And they're just getting right back out. They yep. have no bail today. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you, the job is tougher today. I mean, policing, I don't care if you're in the smallest town or the biggest city or in rural areas. Policing is always a tough job. It was always Definitely. dangerous right. and tough. Right. I mean, it might look easier in certain places. There's things cops do that are always dangerous. The most minute things. People see it every second of their lives, and they don't even think about it. When you see a cop pulling over a car, he's over there. What do they say? Oh, that fucking cop's right. He's harassing them. Yeah, yeah he's look harassing, harassing giving that the guy team. over there. Yeah. But that cop doesn't know if he's stopping murderers or guys who just committed a rape or a robbery. Exactly. It's a very dangerous uh, situation, and you drive by it. You don't even think nothing. If you think of anything, you're thinking that he's harassing a driver right. or giving out a mover. Right. But there's so much more to it. And it's a dangerous situation. And it's always been a dangerous job, but we had backing back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, uh, That's huge. Uh, and police were feared and police were respected. And that's what you need to do policing. You know, you don't, you don't need some, uh, you know, four foot ten guy showing up, uh, you know, saying, could you please not do that? You know, you can get your neighbor <laughs> who's strong or bigger and strong. You need yeah. policing. It's not meant for everybody to be a cop. Just like it's not That's meant true. for everyone to be a surgeon. It's right. not meant for everyone to be a lawyer. It's not everyone to be a, a plumber or an electrician. You've got to be trained. You've got to be physically fit. You've got to be doing a certain – you've got to have standards. Definitely. And when, when you respond to a job, I'm sure that the people that call you who need your help – Want someone who comes who's super they feel qualified. Confident. They want to feel confident. Exactly. That you're there, that you could handle their problem. That's They're calling right. you when they need you. That's absolutely right. Now, do you feel like history is kind of repeating itself as far as crime is concerned? Now, I'm not saying that the city is going to be burning down like it was in the Bronx back well, in the Well, it 70s. was burning down this year. <laughs> well, that is true. That is true. But you I'm know, talking about like the vacants you, and stuff you, like that. Yeah, things are coming back. You know, Giuliani and Bloomberg and... Koch and these kind of mayors had control of the city. Yeah. You know, they got a job to do. They're not doing their job today, you know. I think judges don't do their job either. You know, they should be sentencing prisoners. They should be, the DAs don't do their job. They're not prosecuting. You know, that all you ever hear, all you ever hear is police accountability. And the police are the pawns in this. And they oh, yeah. get, and they oh, get yeah. the most scrutiny. We do. But how come we're responsible and have accountability and judges and DAs don't? If a judge releases a criminal that's a killer or going to kill or rob again, the people should be able to sue that judge. He should be held responsible, lose his job, lose his position. Yeah. Why is it always the cop's fault? 
Listen, you know, I, I, agree. I guess the shit rolls downhill. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I but agree. there's no only in police accountability. Right. You don't hear anyone ever chanting DA responsibility, district attorney uh, responsibility, or judge responsibility, or parole board responsibility. That's true. No one's held accountable except police. And I think that that's one of the reasons why morale is so low right now. Exactly. In the I, I don't know what it is that you hear. I know you stay in contact. I hear with, the same thing you do. You I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I deal with cops. Very big on social media, yeah. and I'm out in the street. You know, right. um, you know, I work a security job now, but I, I talk to people. I have thousands of friends. Sure, and uh, I, I know, and I keep up on the news plays 24 hours a day in my house. Right, even if we're not paying attention, it's on. Um, I have the news. I live uh, out of New York State, but I have the daily news and the post delivered to my door every morning. Okay, so I'm up on everything, Still on and top I, of watch everything. The, I watch. I uh, watch f- Channel Five, Channel Two, Channel mm-hmm. Seven. Fox News. I watch everything. I keep abreast of everything so I can do shows like yours, <laughs> you know, and be up on the times and That's stuff. Great. That's and, great. So I feel like I can still carry on a, a I'm not going to say an intelligent, intelligent station. But you know, you're I, in the know. I'm in you the know. You know what's going on. That's what I'm going to say. I'm, I'm up on current affairs yeah. and current events and policing matters as yeah. much as I could be. Okay. One of, the, one of the biggest things right now is the job is dead. Well, they, what heard. they're talking, that, that pertains or that relates to uh, what we were discussing, no yeah. backing. Yeah. Uh, the camaraderie is pretty much shot. shot. Um, the laws that are being passed by city council and just the anti-police sentiment. And, you know, you're, I, listen, I know it's going to turn around because it it's turning around in some of these other states. I think it's in Portland now. Uh, they're begging for the police come back. You know, and yeah, look they just, what they're going to you know, add a bunch of police officers. And now uh, look what it. happened with uh, January sixth with the Congress when they were overran. Uh, all those politicians, uh, you know, I think they were praying for the cops to be there. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm being sarcastic. I know they were praying for the cops. <laughs> they were all shitting in their pants. Yeah, you know, and that's when they. I think a lot of that defunding cry has been quieted down ever since they realized they, you know, our joke of years ago used to be the definition of a liberal is someone who hasn't been mugged yet. Oof. You know what I mean? That was the thing back then. Yeah. But now these politicians are seeing they could be a victim just as easy. That's right. That's and right. who are they going to call? And that's you know? the problem. I think that a lot of these politicians, they need to speak to people that are actually living in the neighborhoods that need us. No, you know what you got to do? You got to take these politicians, put them in the back of a radio car on a midnight in a ghetto precinct and let them go in the backyard with you. Let them go back there first. Let them go back there with you. Let them see what it does. I tell you right now, they're shit in their pants. They couldn't do a job a cop does. There's people that are cut out to be cops, right. and there's a reason for that. They got balls. These politicians ain't got balls. <laughs> they're not going to do that shit. They're home in their bed, behind their walls and behind their gates, and and Monday morning quarterbacking. Oh, that's the easiest thing to do. That's, Absolutely. They love to do that with the police and the police department. Yeah. Let so, them walk a mile in our shoes. So let me ask you, if you were to place yourself the, the 23, 24, 25-year-old Ralph into today's climate. That wouldn't work. Not why, for me. And why is that? No, nah, because uh, I, I could not. For, with, first of all, I was brought <laughs> up different. You know yeah. what I mean? It's a... It's a different world. Yeah. I'd probably be indicted before I made it to the end of the corner. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work. Listen, I, when I, what I did then, I'm not going to say it was accepted. It was, that's what needed to be done. Yeah. It, it's what cops had to do. Right. That was the, you were taught, we, we came out of the academy uh, with an attitude that you are the police. You were taught that you win. If you tell someone you're under arrest. I said. You're under you have two choices, and you could go easy or the hard way. That was it. You're not making an appointment. You're not resisting arrest. I mean, you could resist arrest, but <laughs> that's your choice. <laughs> you know, today they make appointments. They, uh, you know, it's, tell them to come in, turn themselves in. No, you in. would talk, if they fight with a stick, you fight with a gun. You know, if if, if they fight with their hands, you use a stick. They use a stick, you use your gun. You know, you're gonna win no matter what it is. I seen uh, when the first training video came out with this new compression stuff. I was privy to it, and it was. Uh, it, it, I don't know how a cop fights a person today. The how compression do you, stuff. What What are you referring uh, to? When a cop makes an arrest today, you can't restrict their breathing or blood flow. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that thing made you had to be. If you're not a tenth degree black belt, there's no way you could take someone into custody unless you have four cops. The best you could do That's is right. grab one arm. They got to grab an arm and two legs. 
You can't put your you can't compress their back, their ribs, their rib cage, their chest, That's right. the blood flow, the neck from the right. back or the front. You can't do nothing. Right. How do you fight a guy? We were taught you do anything you can to survive. To, to not but to make an arrest. You know, survive is even further, but we right. were taught you make that arrest. Whatever you gotta do. It's called necessary force. Right. And it's not our choice. Police officer doesn't get to make the choice. The perpetrator makes the choice. You place him under arrest, he makes the choice. If he's gonna shoot at you, you gotta shoot back. If he's gonna try to stab you, you gotta fight with him. He makes the choice. We don't just go over and beat people up. That's true. You know, they make the choices. We yeah. only, they do the action, we do the reaction. It's their choice. If they go peacefully, they get treated like a gentleman, no matter right. what they did. Right. You know, we don't beat a person for nothing. That's absolutely right. You I know, agree. if you do that, then you're going to get fired or you'll be arrested. But so, we have laws just like, we probably have more laws than the perpetrator. That's true. That's it's very true. true. I mean, I think that's why a lot of police officers now, they freeze up. Well, they you get know, out there in the streets and, I think and they it don't does, know what to do. I think it affects them in the matter that they know that everything they're doing is being filmed. A cop goes out, gets out of his car to go buy a cup of coffee or a slice of pizza. There's like 30 cameras ready on him or Absolutely. on him already. You know, he, he can't win. He, he feels, you know, if I make this move, I'm going to lose my job. If I make that move, I'm going to be fired. I'm going to lose my health benefits. I'm going to lose my pension, lose my paycheck. My wife's going to lose her benefits. You know, I'm going to be on the news. I'm going to be on the front page. I'm going to be on uh, YouTube tomorrow. Yeah. By tonight, before I'm off duty. And people are going to be protesting you know, in front of my I house. I think that <laughs> sort of affects police work. And oh, that's it absolutely bad. does. It absolutely does. You know, a police does. officer has to respond with his knowledge, his reflex, his training. And if you're going to hesitate because of a camera, you're going to get hurt. Right. And I'm, you don't hear about it too much because, you know, they try to play things their way, their agenda is to have you filmed and stuff. But I think, I'm sure that some police officers have been hurt for inaction or hesitation. And that's sad. Yeah, it is. They're taking away, they're hurting good police officers. That's and what do you right. do when you hurt a good police officer? You're hurting they're not, the citizens. They're not police officers anymore. You're hurting the citizens that they serve. Right. You know, the, the, the public takes the hit first. That's true. You know, true. It's, it's just a sad state of affairs. And I... I I, I just don't care for politicians that let that occur. And they're doing it on purpose. They have an agenda. You I know, agree. defund police, disarm police. There was some passengers where they, they don't want a uh, good faith. They want to throw out the window where you could be sued civil civil. A cop's going to take an action. If you, even if you don't do anything wrong, you would have to identify yourself. That's right. So it could cost you 25000 for a lawyer for doing nothing. That's right. For a false suit. They take away, because you have a, as a police officer, you're supposed to be covered by the city you work for, indemnified, it's called, and uh, for good faith acts. If you feel you're acting in good faith, the officer is doing the best he can. That's right. You know, if they take these things away from you, you know, they take away the use of force, they take away compression, uh, fighting. When you, I mean, you know what? Anyone who passes that law or agrees with it, it only tells me one thing. They've never been in a fight before. That's true. That's, That's all it tells true. me. Tells me one hundred percent they've never been in a fight, right? Because they don't know what the shit. What the it, fuck they're talking about? It's true, and and then you go in, on the internet and you see people that I, they have these uh, simulations. You know what I'm talking about? I've seen the officer that gives the uh, the um, uh, the tactics thing on the compression course, right? You know that guy's a trained uh, martial artist, right? You know your, your typical cop is. Just trained in some physical fitness. Mm -hmm. When we went to the, I don't know how they do the academy today, but we had full contact. If you didn't hit your partner, I mean really hit him, the the, uh, instructor's going to come over and he's going to be your partner next. And you're going to get punched in the face. Oh, man. Full contact we had. Yeah. In judo and boxing. Okay. And you, you know, you know, in the street, then you're not, the perp ain't going to hold back. Right. You got to be able to, you know, take a hit and give a hit. And we were trained that way, you know. And uh, you know, you can't do make believe. It's not, this is no, real police no, work. Yeah, yeah. You know, I say <laughs> there's real cops, and then there's real cops. Real being R E E L, which is make believe <laughs> TV movie cop. Yeah. And then you got real cop R E A L, the guys right. that are on the street, on the uh, front lines protecting right. the public. Well, what I was getting at is they have these simulations now, where or simulations, if you want to call it that where you have a civilian that actually gets placed into a, a situation as if they were a police officer. And a lot of them, they actually go through situations where they end up shooting a perp 
and it's not even warranted for them to do it, and then they understand. Exactly. I kind of of feel that— That's great training. Right. I kind of feel that some of these lawmakers, if they had to go through something like that before coming up with police policy, I think that it would give them a better understanding, and it would trickle down to the point where they're able to help police officers feel like they can be confident in doing their job. Exactly. That goes back to where I'm saying— Throw them in the back of a radio car and exactly. let them go to a run at three. <laughs> well, you know they're not going to do that. <laughs> you know well, they're not going to do that. There used to be some like ride alongs. Right. No, but know? I'm saying like politicians hopping in the car. They should. They should. Absolutely. It, it, you know how we have certain requirements to become in our job? That should be their requirement. Definitely. You know, if they're going to make comments and make law and one day quarterback about police, they should see what a police, a police officer does. They should take a ride. That's true. Go in the ghetto, go in the alley in the middle of. Go to where, uh, where a, a family is fighting with each other, domestic. That's right. Go to the emergency room. See the blood wounds that come in. Feel that People emotion. stabbed and shot by other civilians. Yeah. You know, and let them see what's going on. Absolutely. Like I said, I lived in the Bronx 20 years. And just a couple of miles away, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I lived on the other side of the Bronx. Yeah. It wasn't nobody's fault. I just wasn't exposed to it. Right. But right. if you could take someone and expose them to it, in the academy, what they did expose us to was dead bodies. They made you go to the morgue. I did hear about that. Yeah, we used to go to the morgue and watch autopsies and take that smell in. No one ever smelled that if you weren't there. There's no smell in the world like that. Yeah, but to see what a body yeah. looks like from the inside out, right? you know, go to an emergency room, see them do uh, take a bullet, open a guy's chest, spread the rib cage apart. You did that in the academy? No, but I, I did that the minute I got out of the academy. <laughs> in the 4 one, you were in right. the emergency room every night. Okay. You know, right. but in the academy, they just made us go to the, uh, we didn't do any infield training uh, outside on the street, but we did go to the morgue. Okay. And I'm telling you, that's an experience that people don't understand. Right. They don't even probably know it exists. So let me ask you, would you be in such an active cop and you get into situations where, you know, unfortunately there have been some people that have died as a result of you protecting yourself, which is warranted. Have you feared any retaliation? You know, I, I, <laughs> I didn't. You know, it just, I, I didn't feel it. You know, and I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> perpetrators knew where I lived. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't living with my wife. I didn't even mind telling them. You know, I had a reputation. I would take my gun belt off. Guys would say, oh, you're a big shot. You got a gun and a shield. You know, let's see, man to man. I'd take off my gun belt and fight them in the cell. How would they and know? In the street, I'd tell them where I live. I don't give a shit. You would tell them straight I didn't up. give a shit. <laughs> and why, I, was a na- I was a neighborhood guy anyway. Yeah. They, it was easy to follow me home to where I went. Okay. You know, I lived in, in the Bronx, but then I moved and I went in the academy. I just moved up to Yonkers. But I was just over the line. I mean, everyone knew where I lived. I was, I was on the streets all the time. If there yeah. was, even if I lived in Yonkers, they knew where I lived. I'd tell them where I lived. They'd see where I lived. But I was hanging out in the Bronx all the time. Right. You wanted to retaliate. I was there. So you, you know, were we, t- you, it, listen, was, it was more of a challenge. It was just we like, were, all right, you want to talk we, that nonsense? Let's get yeah, to it. Yeah. Listen, I was at the top of my physical game. You know, I was young, dumb, and full of cum. <laughs> you know, and it, I was dating girls in the area. Yeah. You know, it, I didn't give a shit, and I just felt invincible. It was probably stupid on... Thinking back, but, you know, back then it was just different. They feared cops. Yeah. Listen, they wanted to be where I wasn't. Guys would call the precinct and say, is Friedman? I, I want to talk to Friedman. And the sergeant would say, oh, he's not in today. Call back tomorrow. Then they would know he's not in there. And they, they were really free for all. Like, years later, yeah. when the, they caught on to this stuff, all the bosses, anyone answers the phone, say he's in the field. But at the time, they said, no, he's not in today. Then they would take That's t- respect they, right there. That's right. They'd that's go respect. out in the street. Now, you did have a close call, right? I had a lot of close calls. You had a close call with uh, you almost set up? Yeah, but that was yeah, that was a close call. I was dating a girl, right? And, uh, you know, we would get, get into the next stage, and she had me, I mean, we had dinner and stuff, and the next thing I knew, she was inviting me up to her house. And I knew what that meant, you know. So uh, I wound up making a collar. I didn't make it up there. And... Uh, it was a freaky thing. I, and then she's going, oh, come on, come over, come over. We didn't have cell phones. She was calling the precinct. I was calling the house. Yeah. And uh, I said, no, I, I'm stuck with this collar. I got to make do the paperwork and everything. I didn't want the collar, but if it was a decent collar, I always took the collars. Yeah. And uh, next day I go into work, and there were two, two suits there. Uh, we get a 10-2. I'm out with my partner. We get a 10-2 forthwith. Right. So I, 
I said, man, what the hell is that, man? I don't know what's going on. So we go into the priest, right? Excuse me. That's the report to the precinct. So we get there. I see the two suits, and the boss goes to my partner, uh, go downstairs, tells me to come in the room. So I, right away we figured it was IAD, saying, what the hell do we do wrong now? We're mm-hmm. being questioned for yeah. what phony allegation is this? Right. You know? So I sit down, and it winds up it's two detectives. I was in the, the 4 anti crime at the time. It's two detectives from uh, internal affairs. Oh, I was in the squad, me. I was in the squad. You were in the squad at that point. Okay. Yeah, I was in the squad. And uh, these, it was two detectives from uh, in the intelligence division. So they said, uh, uh, they introduced themselves. They say, uh, do you know this girl, Lucy, so-and-so? And I said, I'm t- my mind's racing. I say, holy shit, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, said, uh, were you supposed to be with her last night? I said, yeah, but I, I made a call. I was up all night with the call. Yeah. He says, well, we're intelligence, and uh, just to tell you, we got feedback from a CI, confidential informer, that she had two or three guys up there in her closet waiting to kill you. I said, I'm like, my head is spinning. I said, what are you talking about? What, what did you feel? What did you feel I, at that point? My head was spinning. I, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I felt like I got hit and I was like dizzy. Okay. And uh, they said, yeah, you know uh, you know who she is? I said, yeah, it was my girlfriend, Dana. He says, well, it was her brother that you killed two uh, six months ago. And uh, they tell me his name and I remember the incident. Uh, and it, it, that's his his, his uh Common law sister, you know, sister uh, in law, or some, some relationship, right? Like a sister, something or other, and she was setting me up all this time. Jeez. So we didn't have cell phones or none, but I never returned. She used to call my house. We had answering machines. Uh-huh. I never returned the call. Never saw and again. I guess after I never saw her again. You know, I mean, she probably saw me in the street. Yeah. You know, but uh, not, you know, I might have seen her or something, but never had contact. Her. That was it. Man, that's scary, man. You know, and they, you know, she <laughs> couldn't scary. be arrested for setting me up because. Why is that? Well, I tell you two good reasons, which made very much sense, and you'll understand. First, well, all it was if a CI tells you something, it's really a he said, she said. True. That's number one. So there's no evidence or nothing there. Right. It's not recorded. And the next thing was they'd be burning a good CI. Mm. You know, if you have a CI who gives you like ten things and all ten are good, you don't want to burn this guy where you can't use him. That's true. Because he would have to be the one to go to court. Right. So for a he said, she said case to burn a great CI, you just don't do that thing. Where no one's injured, no one's shot, no one's killed. You know, they're not going to do that. Okay. You know, if I would have got shot or killed, then they would have had to bring the CI out. Right. Expose him, and she would have been called for setting me up. But to burn a CI, I've had CIs, very good CIs, so-so CIs. You have all kinds of CIs. You, you, the last thing you want to do is burn a really good one. And a good one who gives you information, and it's always right. Right. You know, you get some CIs give you 10 cases, and five of them are good, or four or six. But you get a guy who's a great CI, you don't want to burn him. That's the last thing you want to do. Absolutely. Because he's your uh, faucet to information. Absolutely. So, unfortunately, you had to retire early. Yes. And that was as a result of? A line of duty injury. Okay. Uh, uh, I just got back from a motorcycle trip. I was down in Virginia with my newest girlfriend, <laughs> right? I was only with her for like four months. Okay. You know, but I was dating some other girls too. But uh, she and her sisters uh, flew down there cause, uh, and some other girls that were dating the guys I went with. We went down by motorcycle. We went from Wednesday to Wednesday. Right. And the girls flew down after work on a Friday night, Madison, Virginia Beach. And we just rode around all weekend, had a good time and... Then the girls flew back to be in work Monday, Mm -hmm. and we rode back, you know, took our time and rode back. So I just got into work, and I was, like, still vibrating, you know, still vibrating from a 10, 12-hour ride. And not that it was my partner's fault, but I let my partner, Timmy Kennedy, drive. And uh, he was my best detective partner, by the way. Okay. My best police partner and anti-crime partner was Lester Rudnick. Wait, so so back then you did more patrol as a detective? Oh, yeah, I always went on patrol. I used to cover it by saying uh, I was out interviewing uh, complainants and witnesses. So it gave me an excuse to be in the street, and I would make pickup collars. Okay, so you kind of missed being out there in the street. Oh, I still stayed out there. Okay. You know, that was my excuse to get in the street. Right. And how I played the system, this was, this was a cool trick that worked for me. And always my bosses loved me. The detective bureau is about clearing cases. Yeah. You know, so you had to clear cases. So what I would do is I've always worked on my cases, and I'd have good, great clearance rate. But what I would do to bring up the clearance rate of the whole squad, 
I'd go out, make a pickup collar, do the 61 on it, and instead of closing it out, I refer it to the squad. And then I would pick it up. <laughs> and then I'd close it out with a collar. Nice. So if I nice. made a gun collar, I refer to 61 to myself. Okay. So then they, we got clearance for it. That's smooth. So they, they, they loved it. Yeah. And they said, well, why are you in the street? I said, well, I was on the way to this 61, investigate this witness, this complainant. So I always had an excuse to be in the street. Okay. So that was my thing. And the bosses let me dress the way I want. You know, I, I always went out in jeans. and I, I was dressing like anti-crime. That's and awesome. I made so many collars and did so much work that way that they assigned white shielders to me and anti-crime guys. They would refer, refer. We were like an unofficial robbery unit, a RIP unit, robbery investigation yeah. program. So what we would do is I'd work with the anti-crime guys. Mm-hmm. They would refer the robbery cases to me in the squad. And, and then I'd work, work with, with them and we'd go after these robbery teams. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> that's you know? awesome. All so right. uh, that's how we did it. So you, you so, were out that day. So we were out on patrol. Yeah. And uh, making our way rounds to the drug locations and following people. And, so, and over the air comes a 1013, which is a police officer in trouble in most cities. That's the code. Especially in New York, it's a 1013 cop needs assistance. Yeah. And it was a real one because you get fake ones too. Mm-hmm. You get people that just call to get cops in a certain area or bullshit. They want to see radio cars race with the lights on. This was a real 13 because right. the cop himself was calling it. So you know that one's for real. Definitely. So we're racing over there, and we're coming from, uh, we decided we're driving, we were driving west, and we're going to drive as far west as we could, which was on Bedford Park, and we're going to make a left to go south on Jerome Avenue, because we're heading down to 183rd Street, mm-hmm. which was the border of the 4, 6, and 5, 2. And what happens when we got to the intersection, we're racing, you know, you know how you go to a 13. Oh, yeah. And a radio car, believe it or not, blue and white, was coming from the north, heading straight south. So when we came into that in- intersection, before we could make the left, we don't know who had the light. We don't know if the lights and sirens canceled each other out or the adrenaline going. But before Timmy can make a left, the, the radio car, at unbelievable speed, you know, they're going straight. And they had the light and siren on, they were blue and white. T-boned me, hit me right in the hip, right through the door. The car was demolished. It got them. It hit us. We went into a bus that was parked on the street. So that damaged the other side of the car. They put it in the newspaper. They put the wrong picture. They put the side that wasn't hit by the car. That's oh, how, they couldn't man. even tell the car was. So, I was in a, a Plymouth Volari, which is I don't a small. Even know what that looks like man. <laughs> it's a small little boxy car. Okay. But the funny thing is, I had my. I didn't have my seatbelt on, right? That saved my life. You the, not having a seatbelt. Did on not seat have a seatbelt. Saved my life. The floor came up. The roof came down. The sides came in. I would have been crushed, cut in half. Meanwhile, I was thrown under the dashboard, and that saved my life. They, my, my partner got out. Guys crawled in to talk to me. They said I, I, it took two hours to get me out of the car. They wound up. They had to pull a fire department off a job to come over and cut me out. But I don't remember it. I went into shock after about – I went into shock. They said I was talking to them the whole time. I don't remember anything. You don't remember anything? No, I was knocked out. I was in shock. I was only knocked out for like two minutes, they said, two or five minutes. But then I woke up and I was talking. But I was in shock and it saved my life. Because when you're in shock, sometimes what could kill you or panic you is you see your injuries. Right. I didn't have, you know, limbs hanging off or nothing. Right. But I knew I was fucked up. You know, I was really yeah. broken up. Yeah. But uh, they cut me out and they were talking to me and keeping me calm. But I was in shock. And then I went into the hospital. Uh North Central Bronx, and uh, they put me on such heavy drugs and stuff. You know, I, was, I didn't even know what happened for two weeks later. Yeah. You know, and I woke up and uh, sees like seven girls around my bed. <laughs> and it was all the girls I was dating. Right? I said, you know what? I better pass out. This might make more dangerous than the job. You know? So I, I made like I passed out from the drugs. You know, I just made like I dozed off again. That's great. And uh, uh, my wife to this day, she met all those girls. She was there. Did she you, was the newest one. Did you catch heat after you got out the nah, hospital? They all faded off. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the prognosis was bad. First night, they said I might die. Then the next night, they said, the next day, they said, uh, you know, he's, he's going to live, but he's going to be a cripple. I don't know if he'll walk again. Prognosis wasn't good. You know, I didn't get any surgery. I didn't even get a Band-Aid, a stitch, nothing. No? All my bones broke. 
But I told you, I always took good physical uh, care of myself. Yeah. It acted like a shock absorber. Like my whole body was muscular, and it, the, it acted like a bulletproof vest. Like you get shot in a vest. All the blood rushes to that area, but it doesn't come out because there's no hole. I was black and blue everywhere, but all the bones broke. I broke 23 bones, shattered my hip in 100 pieces, broke my pelvic left, right, upper, and lower. But nothing moved because all the muscle acted as a shock absorber. So they didn't do any surgery. They tested me. I remember waking up one day. It was pretty early on. And I just remembered them sticking a tube in my stomach. Because they wanted to see where the blood was yeah. to see if I had internal bleeding. Right. I remember that. Just remember them cutting. I woke up and looking at my stomach, and I see them putting a little cut to put this uh, tube in. Uh-huh. And they took it out, and they said, you don't have internal bleeding. The blood rushed to that area, but you're not torn inside. So I didn't need surgery. I laid in traction for two and a half months. And then you catch all the garbage you catch in the hospital. I caught a blood disease that I needed treatment wow. six times a day. Six, every four hours, I needed a treatment that took 40 minutes, six times a day for 30 days straight. I had to get that. Then I caught pneumonia. Then I caught uh, bed sores, a phlebitis. My veins collapsed. Yeah. Then one time they came in, they wanted to cut my veins out. Oh. And one doctor saved me. They wanted to cut the veins out of my arms. No, not a doctor. A nurse saved me. I was friendly with the nurses. And, stuff, and his nurse said, uh, listen, use hot compresses a lot. It's really hot, and have people massage your arm, and the veins will come back to life. Okay. Like so many the IVs. Circulation and everything. Yeah, right, and right. It, it worked. Okay. You know, I had, I had a special room in the hospital that had, it was like, a, pretty much like what they call a prisoner room, mm. uh, where you could have the prisoner in one room and had an adjoining room okay. that was connected for a police officer to right. sit. So I always, the, the police department and the DEA at the time took great care of me. I had uh, a police officer assigned to me 24 hours a day, which helped me get better because they took care of me. They helped me. They talked to me when I couldn't sleep. Right. When I had to do physical therapy, That's they great. were there to egg me on right. and help me. That's awesome. And then after about, a, about two months, it lasted about a month and a half. And then somehow it got into where the police couldn't do it 24 hours a day. So the DEA took over. They gave me a detective eight hours and the police department the the police PBA gave me 16 hours when I got out of the out of the hospital ESU took me home ESU gave me a emergency service unit gave me crutches a wheelchair they gave me all the supplies it was great and the DEA gave me a maiden chauffeur so really yeah because I you know I didn't want it at first yeah and uh, I said nah I take care of myself but then I couldn't get around I'm in a wheelchair I was in a wheelchair for months I couldn't even get through my rooms. I couldn't drive. I couldn't cook. I couldn't go shopping. Couldn't make clean my clothes. So they they gave me until my girlfriend came home, and uh, uh, she was there weekends and at nights. But she worked. So they gave me this for si- five or six hours a day, That's for like amazing. three months. Wow. And uh, the I say chauffeur, but they they the maid would drive me. She would make my food. She would clean my house. She'd do the shopping. And wash my clothes. So they took and, care of you. And then they would drive me to the uh, the doc, the, the surgeon. Yeah. You know, the police surgeon. Right, right. And they would take me to uh, the um, police board for, um, you know, the three quarters, your medical board. Then they took me to doctors and they took me to therapy and they took me to the gym. Used to work out for five minutes. I had to lay down for seven hours. And it would keep turning. I'd work out okay. six minutes, yeah. lay down for six and a half hours. You know, they... Everyone treated me great. That's amazing. You know, that's man. why I love the police department to this day and that I would always stand up for the police and the police department. And that's, that's the kind of camaraderie we had. That's awesome. And that's, that's one thing I wanted to mention. I feel like a lot of people take the job for granted. <clears throat> you know, they look at everything that the job doesn't do. They look at a lot of the negatives on the job instead of looking at what the job has provided and the alleys that it will allow you to have through the course of the years. That's so with true. me, with me saying that, when they told you that you weren't going to be able to be a cop anymore, how did that make you feel? Well, a lot of people ask me that question. That's a, a great question. The thing is, there were two things going on. First, they offered me, I could have stayed indoors. 
I knew I couldn't do that. Yeah, and I, when I was a trainee and working those two years indoors, yeah. and when I was in the four four the first six months, yeah. and seeing those cops coming in with collars, I was chomping at the beat at the bit to get out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't wait to get in the street. I know I couldn't work indoors. That would kill me. Yeah. But the thing is, when I was laying in this hospital, I was realizing a couple of things. First, the criminal. I was thirty four at the time, which is still young, Very but young, not. Yeah. But the criminals were getting younger. I was arresting guys. 14, 15 years old with guns. You know, you know, you know you're getting, like now. getting a little slower and they're getting a little younger and faster. Yeah. You know, uh, but the main thing was I didn't let that bother me too much and all this other stuff because my main thing was I had to get my body back. Mm-hmm. The main, I, and the police department helped me, that, helped me with that and the fact that they took care of everything. You know, you're getting your full paycheck. Everyone's taking care of you. They were bringing me so much food that the doctors and nurses that had nothing to do with me, they were on other floors. They heard about it. <laughs> I was treated like a celebrity there. And they would come down and take their lunch break there because there was so much food they would eat for free. That's great. You know, everybody was coming to my room. Yeah. It was like party time all the time. And being in the hospital in the same uh, command where I was hurt, so cops would drop by. It was hundreds of cops that would come and visit you. You know, it'll take 10 minutes, okay, five minutes. But it was 24 hours a day. Right. There were guys stopping up in uniform, bosses, uh, cops, anti-crime. It was like, it was nuts. It was like, it was a great feeling. That's the camaraderie that I felt and still feel, you know, years later. I felt that all my life. And my, my object was just to get better. And being that everything was being taken care of for me, I was able to focus all my effort and thought and uh Effort to go getting better. Right. You know, I just wanted to work out, and I thought about how big and strong I was. I wanted to – I had to feel like a person. Here right. I am laying around getting bed sores for not moving. Right. You know, so you, you just want to be able to walk again and prove these doctors wrong. They so, said I wouldn't walk. So you were content with – you were like, all right, that's fine. I can't be a cop anymore. I just want to get back to walking. I just want to be back to – That was the perp- the main – That's all you that's get about. It. That's what I had to focus. I had no choice. I had to get – there's no choice. I couldn't even be a civilian. That's right. You know, I mean, Absolutely. if I'm in a wheelchair or crutches my whole life, I didn't even want to walk with a limp. You know, I mean, I, I wanted to be me again. Right. So I had to put all my effort, and everybody helped me. And uh, the girl, when I told you the girls were around the bed and they all started to fade out, uh-huh. this one girl hung in there, and she came every single day. Every day. Uh-huh. She did like what I call a triangle. She went from a home to work. Hospital, home, work. Oh, hospital. Look at you. This, this is what she did. <laughs> and I'm still with her today. That's the girl. That's wonderful. My wife. That's your wife. She wow. hung in there. All the others fade out. She met them. There was so white you, girls, so black girls, Spanish <laughs> girls. She met I was seeing everybody, you know. And they all come to the hospital and then they faded out because who wants to be with some bedridden guy or a wheelchair guy? They, she said, she always told me, she said, you know what? You're going to make it. I know you. And she was right. And she hung out. I always tease her because I said, you know, she moved in with me. You know, uh-huh. and I said, "Yeah, you took advantage of me. I was in a wheelchair under drugs, and you just moved in, and held me hostage. You know, I had no choice." <laughs> right, team. But she was great, and she hung in there, and I'm still with her today. That's great, man. God bless. God bless. You know, I'm with her now, going on 38 years. Awesome. So the title of your book is Street Warrior, right? And I wanted to ask you this question here. Now, recently, I would say within I don't even know what the time period is. Maybe within like the t- the past 10 years. You've had the thin blue line flag, and now you see it everywhere. But now you have it put into skulls, Punisher skulls and Spartan helmets. And there's a lot of guys out there that are pretending that they are warriors, or they say that they are warriors <laughs> out there in the street. To you, what what do you think about the thin blue line flag and people portraying themselves in that way? And what, to you, is a street warrior? Okay. Um, well, first, when I was on the job, we didn't have that flag. Right. You know, that was, that's relatively new. Yeah. Uh, but the blue flying flag, to me, it represents the thin... What it really represents is the thin blue line. Mm-hmm. That's all the police officers that are doing their job every day. Yeah. And the blue line separates anarchy from civil disobedience. The thin blue line, they hold the line for, to have a civil uh, society. Yeah. And it's thin because there's only so many cops as compared to the amount of civilians. That's a good breakdown. You know, and that's what I represent. And as far as warriors, uh, I consider police officers that are active police officers that go out there and do the dangerous jobs in dangerous areas and uh, are on the line taking fire. 
You know, if you're a proactive cop going out there, uh, or any cop that's arresting, uh, well, I usually, I mean, personally, I look at it more as uh, proactive units. Okay. You know. Fair enough. Uh, you know, but there are, I mean, everyday patrol is a, a warrior, too. You're going patrol out is there. definitely a tough job. Oh, without a doubt. Definitely you're, a tough job. You're a target. You're in yeah, uniform. Right. But you're doing these things that put you in contact with violent felons. Sure. And what, and the felon only looks at a police officer as a guy who's going to take away their freedom. That's right. And nobody wants their freedom taken away. That's a big thing. That's, that's the biggest thing you own is your freedom. That's right. So that's what they look at as a cop. And police officers are warriors. They're out there on the front line. No matter what they're doing, they could be stopping a car, like I said before, and dealing with the most violent person. And they think even the police officer sometimes let down their guard and say, oh, I got myself a mover. The guy went through a red light. The guy be fleeing a, a, a triple murder. That's true. You yeah. know? Uh, so police officers are warriors in that they put themselves out there. They're on the front line. They're on that thin blue line. And they're taking the risks. They're the, the cops are the guys that are going to take a bullet for a stranger. You know, all right, all right. and as far as the Punisher sign, that they sort of mix that in with the blue line flag. Yeah, it's you know because it just shows a guy. The Punisher was a guy who was just exacting. It was sort of like a revenge, but he's going after criminals. Yeah, and that's what cops do. They go after criminals. Right. So it, you know, some people just take this that they make it look like a vigilante. Right. You know, you know, police are not vigilantes. Vigilantes right. get arrested. You know, police are doing. Their job. That's right. what they're supposed to do. That's what we're trained for. That's what you're educated for. That's what you put yourself out there for. Right. So, but me as warrior, all police are warriors. But I, I mean, myself, I take it another level because I worked in proactive units. And there's guys that go out there that go hunting for BLM, ma, ma, uh, not BLM, BLA ma, uh, guys, you know, or Black Panthers that are shooting cops yeah. or people that are robbing stores or murdering people. You're a warrior. You're going after a, a, a violent person. That's right. And, and you're, you have a chance of getting hurt. You're not the guy who's uh, Monday morning quarterbacking, laying in your bed at night. There's a cop who's working in, in the ghetto and, or in any street in bad weather. They're out in the snow, the rain, the sleet. You know, I think we took over the mailman's job. Because <laughs> uh, I don't get my mail when it snows out. I don't know. But the cop is still out there on patrol. You know, That used to be their mono. mono. Right, right. So, uh, snow, sneet, sleet, and all that stuff. In all weather. In all weather. But when the I, cop is out there. When, when, I, when I think of your era, I think about the movie The Warriors. Was that? That was a street gang thing. No, I know. I know. But You know, the original that? name of my book. Yeah. And I have a TV series also called... Street Justice, the Bronx. And where can you find that? That's on Amazon now. It's on, um, it's on Amazon. It's on Apple TV. Yeah. Uh, it's on a few locations. Right. Uh, and so is the book on Amazon. But right. they wanted to change. My original name for my stuff was going to be called. They changed the name. Uh, they, they gave me some options. And I came up with this name as a secondary name. My original name for my stuff was Unstoppable. Unstoppable. Okay. I, I sort of like that name because... Uh, I just always went out and made collars. I went out with my partner. He was bitching. He was complaining. <laughs> right? It was snowing. The whole city stopped. Right? And I remember this. Uh, we pulled off. There was no one in the street. I just wanted to go out. You know, I was nuts. So I go out, and we, pull, we didn't pull over this car. They were stuck in the snow. We went over to help them. And they got a little fidgety when we went over. And there were four guys in the car. And we started to help them. They said, you know, we don't need your help. You know, they just acted crazy. It was really, it wasn't right. We wind up frisking them, and we find all four were armed with guns. Oh. It was right on Fordham Road, right, by, right past Webster Avenue by Sears Roebuck, which is, I think, out of business now. Yeah. I always remember the snow. Nobody moved. We had chains on our car. So we offered to push them or pull them, push them or pull them out of the snow. And they didn't want our help. They wanted us to go away. <laughs> just go. Saying, just go. We don't need you. Who want our help? That's suspicious <laughs> right there. Right. You're stuck in a blizzard snowstorm that no one could see or move. Right. And you got these two idiot cops out there who are willing to help you. Yeah. And you didn't want us around? That's suspicious. Yeah, right. To right. me, that's profiling them the right Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And we wind up picking up four bad guys with four loaded guns. That's great. So what I was saying about the, the movie The Warriors, I'm thinking more so that, that was the Bronx Warriors. Like a, it was like a gang thing. Right. But was that the era that you... 
It was right, my era was a little after that. I think it I was think that was fifty or sixties. Really, maybe sixties. I thought it was in like I think the it was 60s, 70s. I think it was sixties. I remember the movie. Is that what the Bronx was like back then? Like you, yeah, that was a little Hollywood. Oh, okay, it was a okay. little Hollywood. All right, cool, cool. That was cool. a little Hollywood. So Street th- Justice, the Bronx was a real. Sh- they, I think, I got canceled because. I think they they wanted real police work. I think I gave them more than they could handle. <laughs> you know, because, you know, the networks don't make the shows. They farm it out. You know, when TV shows are made, they're farmed out to production companies. Right. And the production companies always send them little samples. Mm-hmm. I think uh, there was a lot of force there. They even asked me to tone it down and say, bring some guys in uh, vertical. Everyone I brought in was horizontal. <laughs> and I said, they were trying to change the show a little. I said, well, listen, this is how it was. Right. I dealt with violent people if they wanted to fight me then i had to take them down and you know we were in that kind of unit and you know they were trying to tone down the show a little and i think somebody after a while got offended that's my opinion okay at uh at the network and i think that's why i didn't get renewed right away got you you know so so let me ask you this what is it like being retired and especially a lot of people they don't think about when you retire right you might be making bank once you're done but you got to think, you're going to survive for another 30, 40 years. Well, some people say police officers only last another five <laughs> years after retirement, but I think that's a myth. Well, it also depends on how long you stay on the job. True. See, my era, see, today, everyone gets out of 20 years. They know their retirement date in the police academy. Yeah. They, they know when they're getting out. Right. In my day, they used to tease you. They say, you know, kid, you're a rookie for the first 20 years. Everybody stayed on 35, That's what, 40 that's what it was like, huh? Yeah, everybody stayed on. Uh-huh. Today's cops are much smarter. Right. They have other careers. Yeah. They move on. They get out of policing. Side they have, businesses. They're smarter. Yeah. Our cops, in my day, were tougher cops. And that was your life. You that know? was it. Yeah, that that's was who you were. Yeah, that's there who was you no, were. Right. You know? Okay. So you retired back in 84. Well, that was my official date, January 30th of 84. But I got hurt August 1st of 83. They carried me for a couple of reasons. First, I was in the hospital and then a wheelchair. So they kept me on the rolls. And I told you, they treated me real good. Mm-hmm. And they advised me very well. And they told me to retire, you know, at the end of January. And they'd hold me on the rolls. Because the way it laid out, there was an extra check in December, January. Plus, there was uniform money and holiday money. So they gave me like an accountant and said, this is what you do. They advised me very well. Nice. You nice. know, they took care of me. The police department took care of their own. And they advised me this way. And I told you, they did everything for me. They, they were my closer than my family. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, the PBA, the DEA, uh, the department itself, bosses, everybody was good. This is how tight-knit and the camaraderie that we had, you know. We and I that. always remember that. We need that. I had offers. You know, I only made bank one year. That was 2017. I made bank because I had the show and the book out. Uh-huh. You know, otherwise I never really made bank. Right. You know, but uh, I had offers to make bank, but I turned them down because they wanted me to do negative stuff about the police department. Oh, really? I won't do that. I won't do that. I, I, that's like biting the hand that feeds me. I respect I that. will not do that. I respect that. I was that. offered some parts. I was offered things to go on shows and talk about the negative stuff. Right, because that's I what sells. That's what sells, unfortunately. Exactly. I'm not going to feed into that. And I turned it down. I also had an opportunity to work with that, uh, that guy, Lilo. Who, Who's um, that? He was in The Sopranos, and uh, he wound up k- killing a cop in the uh Oh, that the guy, Bronx. the guy in the Bronx. That's right. He... They, I, I, a guy, I knew the guy who was making the movie. They offered me a part, big part in it. I said, I'm not working A movie with that on guy. his life? No, it was some movie, but he was in it. Okay. Involved. okay. He was a main character, too. He just got out of jail. He did like a... He's out? Yeah, he's out. Oh, man. Yeah, he's making he movies and stuff. Now. Oh, man. man. Now, I, I was offered the part right away. I said, there's no way I'm taking it. They said, yeah. well, we're going to pay you good. I said, I don't care. I can't work with that scumbag. No way. So you're loyal. But I had other you're, t- you're loyal, man. It, I'm always a loyal guy. That's great. You know, I'm not bragging about it, but people who know me, I'm loyal. And it's just, that's no, me. It's I'll stick by anybody. I'll give anybody the benefit of the doubt until they fuck me. No, that's something you that know? needs to be talked about because I feel like loyalty, especially within the department, is definitely. You know, I don't need contracts. Loyal. I could shake hands, you know, and that's my deal. Right. You live by that handshake. That's word, how it was. Right. Your word is your bond, and the handshake is. is any everything. man, I don't care what color, creed, rela- religion, anything. You know, you show me who you are. That's what I respect. That's right. You know, All right. that's it. Now, I'm going to be a little selfish here. I work in the East Harlem area. 
and you have tons of stories. Would you happen to have anything? Well, I do have one story from up there, in, in the, <laughs> up in the two three precinct. Yeah, you know, uh, this is going to sound a little strange to cops today and stuff. Okay, but back in the day, when we vouched evidence, you didn't put it in a safe behind the desk or have it sent down to the lab or the ballistics. We at any given time. Uh, I had heroin and guns in my house. We used to bring them down ourselves. What? You voucher them, and you bring home the voucher. It sounds, sounds crazy because it breaks the chain of evidence. Of course, of course. But actually it didn't because we're in possession of it. Okay. But no one looked at it that way. But they trust you. You're the yeah, police officer. You're, you're held at a higher standard. Yeah. So, okay. so I'd have guns and drugs in my house. And the only drug I really dealt with, especially in the South Bronx, was uh, heroin. So I always had heroin in my house. Yeah, they didn't have crack. Vouching. They didn't have crack back then. No, it was more cocaine. Crack, crack came out. Well, cocaine wasn't affordable in the precincts I worked in. Yeah, that was a higher priced drug. True. I didn't see that. Okay. And uh, uh, pills weren't around then. That okay. wasn't a thing. Yeah. We just saw heroin. Okay. You know, and it was the hippies and the white kids that did uh, the marijuana. We didn't deal with that either. Okay. But, you know, until I went later on in my later years up in the. North Bronx. Right. But all we saw was heroin. Okay. You know, uh, what we did see, which the city gave out, was methadone. But that was the same thing in liquid form. It was just a gimmick. Uh, it's the same thing. That's There's no difference strong. in heroin. That's it's, still going strong. <laughs> was, you know, the first Coke, just to not get off the subject I'm going to tell you, but yeah. the first Coke I saw, I went up into the North Bronx. I collared a, a girl. I, I collared this guy, right, in the bathroom of a diner. He was taking out liquid in vials. I didn't know what the hell it was. I wind up a collar him, and he's then outside the, the it was in a diner, yeah. and outside the bathroom, he was with his nurse. He was with two nurses. I wind up, I lock them all up. I found out that they use pure heroin in liquid, I'm not heroin, cocaine in liquid form. You'll never guess what it was used for back in the day. It might even still be today. Cleaning your drinks? No, they used to use it to clean. It was a nurse. She stole it from the hospital. They used to clean operating instruments. Scalpels and stuff were clean with liquid cocaine. Wow. <laughs> I've also seen, oh, wow. uh, from a druggist I knew, crystallized uh, cocaine used for treatment in the eyes. Yeah. Never heard of that before. Yeah. All the way back then, too. Wow. Yeah, I was friends with a druggist. He showed me the coke that was crystallized for using in the eyes. But I wound up locking this, uh, these nurses up. It was a male nurse. One of the guy was a male. Uh -huh. He had two female nurses sitting in the diner with him. I called them all. They had these liquid little vials, about two, three inches. Crazy. So anyway, Crazy. getting back to the story. So I have some guns in the house, and it was my day off. And I, it was a Sunday, and I was dating this girl. Well, I was dating a couple of girls, but I wasn't my regular girl, <laughs> right? So I call up this girl. I say, listen, you want to take a ride downtown? You know, it was a, she says, yeah, sure, you know. So I take her with me, and we drive down the East River Drive go down to ballistics, and the ballistics and the labs were all in the uh, police academy on 20th Street. You know, I don't even know where they are today, you know? Right. But they were always in the police academy on 20th Street. Okay. Between Lex and, uh, I think it was 2nd. Right. So go down there, bring the gun in. And this girl I took down there was like a hot-looking girl at the time. <laughs> you know, I wasn't always an old man. I had young girls as a girlfriend. Got you, got you. Right? So I go down there. And, you know, got the, all the detectives woke up when I walked in with her, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So they were all, like, showing off and stuff. And how they used to test the guns was fire them in a tremendous tank. It was probably as long as this room, but about this narrow. They fire them into water. And the bullet, they fire it into cotton sometimes and, and also into water. Uh -huh. So the gun would go in the water and then just die out and fall down. They have the gun with all the striations on it. Yeah. So they take out some guns. And they start showing off, and they're firing guns, and put on a whole show for us. <laughs> Took out a, a, a submachine gun, oh, yeah? uh, a grease gun, you know, and they're firing machine guns. Nice, nice, nice. From, you know, they're showing us all kinds. They put on a whole show for us. Finally, I get her out of there. We drop the gun off. They test it. They say it's functional. They got their evidence. And they give me the report that says gun is operable. Okay. That's all you need for court. Right. You know, but they would keep the slugs in case there's a match to other homicides. Right? So we're coming up the East River Drive, and it was a horrible day, but it really got really bad. And I know to this day, this still goes on. The East River Drive going north floods out. It does. It does, it right? Does. It you does. Know, you know that, right? People hydroplane. You would think in the, the last rails. 50 years they might have been able to fix the, the sewers, right? Same good Not that some things yep. ever change, right? 
So I'm going up there, right? And uh, so I, could, I had to get off the East River Drive going north. Yeah. So I decided to take First Avenue because that's the northbound lane. So I'm going up first, and I get to a light at 105th and uh, First Avenue. And all of a sudden, I hear gunshots. And as I hear the gunshots, a second, I mean literally a second later, two bodies fall on the hood of my car. <laughs> right on my car, right? And these two guys are shooting and stabbing each other. Literally shooting and shooting stabbing, and each, stabbing other. each other on my car, on the hood of my car, in a rainstorm that no one's out, just these two guys and me and the girl. I jump out of the car, right, pull my gun, right, and I hit the guys, and they fall down, right? One falls down dead. The other guy is going to die, right? Blood all over the place. Cars are responding now because the shot's being fired and stuff. Right. Right? And I got this girl. Radio cars come up and everything. They take everybody to the hospital. In those days, believe it or not, because I still have them, I have the arrest reports. In those days, you'd call it a dead guy. Today, they don't do that. Put cuffs on them and everything. No, but you don't have to cuff them. I don't think you'll get away, but you... Uh, still process an arrest. You're still process an arrest. Okay. And you put down uh, deceased. Okay. You know, I lock up most of the, all the, get the guys I killed, you know? You so, were- you get an arrest number. You get activity, you know? Yeah, wow. the, good, the good thing is you don't have to go to court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the two guys have been arrested. They got sheets as long as your arm, right? They've been arrested for 15 years fighting each other. Every, other, every year they shoot or stab each other. But so this you, was the day it you ended. Look up, you look up their history and you see 15 well, years Well, I found fight. out, you know, later on when yeah. everything comes up. They were going at each other for 15 years over the same woman. Unreal. The same woman's there 15 years. The two guys each year, they shoot or stab each other. Unreal. You, you and where was, the, where was the woman at this time? Who knows? But you can't make <laughs> this stuff up. This is only in New York. Unreal, You man. can't make this up. Man. So anyway, I get to the emergency room. And we're all in there. And bosses are interviewing me. And I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm more concerned with getting the girl out of there. Because now <laughs> the press is responding. Yeah. And I don't want them... You know, get a picture of me with this girl. I got to go home to my girlfriend. Right. <laughs> I'm more concerned You're about that man, than the two man. bodies. I don't, I don't know you how you did it. You got to do a lot it. of juggling. You know? I don't know how you did it, man. It's a lot of juggling. <laughs> right? But. So the guys helped me out. We get the, got the girl out. My, my brother came down, picked her up, and took her away. Good and I you, stayed man. there with the collars and the aides and the, the bosses and the press. <laughs> So you got your old tee, you still kept the girl, it all worked out I had well. another incident that was close to the 2-3. I think it was the 19th. Who covers, uh, I think it was the 19th. Up at Eastside? Yeah, it was on 78th Street in the East River Drive. Yeah, that's the 19th. That's the 19th, yep. right? That was a, I was down in the village, right? I was on my motorcycle. I rode a Harley. I think we got about five more minutes, just a heads up. Okay. Uh, I was down on, the, anyway, I, got, I was riding my Harley uptown. I was supposed to meet my brother in Queens, yeah. coming uptown with a girl, and we were really like an hour or two early. So we pulled over on the East River Drive to make out on those benches on the <laughs> thing. So we're making out, and I see these two guys come up to me, right? It was two or three guys, and they start to surround me. I, right away, I, I tell the girl, listen, I'm, I, got, I had my gun on my waist, and I had one on my ankle. Okay. I tell her, listen, if anything happens. You always kept those on you? Yeah, two thirty eights, Detective Colts, six shots. So I tell her, if anything happens, just hit the deck. I don't like the looks of these guys, right? So they come around me, and behind me and in front of me. They look at me, and I'm, I got a Harley day. I got motorcycle boots on. I'm wearing, a tank, top. I'm wearing a tank top All right. with Cut uh, tattoos and yeah, yeah, muscles yeah, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I feel you. They just walk away. But they go over to, an, up on the 78th Street, there's an overpass. You go straight up, and then you go over the highway. I know what you're talking walkway. about. Walkway. Yeah. So they go over to some people there. And they get into a conversation with him. And then they go up on the top of the ramp and they get into a conversation. I said, listen, I'm going to check this out. So instead of making out with this girl I got on the East River Drive, I go over to these guys. They start crying. And they said, they just robbed us at gunpoint. Oh. All three had guns. I run up the ramp because they were at the top of the ramp with these other people. Yeah. And now they go over the ramp. I can't see them right away. I get up to the rock and they're crying. They just robbed us, took everything. So I go to chase them. I'm screaming, police freeze with my gun out. And they shoot at me. I shoot at them. I think I hit one of them. They get they get up to the end of the thing is a road, 78th Street. Uh-huh. They jump into a waiting car. And I'm chasing the car up 78th Street. Running. They, running. They hit a light. I think I could catch them. They make the light. I jump into a cab on the next avenue there. 
And the cab driver looks at me. And, you know, they used to keep in the old days a cigar box on the seat with the change. Okay. And the bills to yeah. the change to people. Yeah, yeah. There were no petitions or nothing. Right. And I'm saying, police, what? He sees me sweating, tattoos, muscles, uh, tank top, <laughs> and a gun in my hand. Probably he did. thinks I'm robbing him. Yeah. So he doesn't drive. He puts it in park. I'm saying, chase that car, chase that car. He thinks I'm saying, give me the money. He throws the money in the back seat, showering me with dollar bills and coins. <laughs> right? So they got away. Yeah. I go, now I got to go into the precinct. And I tell them, listen, the girl called the police too. Right? The one you were with. Yeah, she called the police from payphone and describes me. She had to make her way over the highway and get to a payphone and tell them, my boyfriend looks like this, you know. And, and this. So the cops knew who I was. They, so we all go in the 19th. Nobody shows up. I'm there myself. Unreal. So the boss is there. They bring in a duty captain. He's interviewing me. And, you know, they, you know the questions they ask. He says, oh, you ever been in a shooting before? So, uh, yeah, I've been in like eight, nine of them. He looks at me. He thinks I'm a nut. <laughs> you know, the way I'm dressed, the way I look. I'm firing my gun. Yeah. I might have shot somebody. They shot at me. And I, I got this story and no complainants, no witnesses, no nobody. So, so they interview me. They, the duty captain brings in another captain. And they all start into me. They do the whole thing. I'm walking out of the precinct now after about two and a half hours, Right. And all of a sudden, as I'm walking out, all these people are coming in. See, that's the cop that tried to save him. They shot at him, and he shot at him. Nice, now I got like nice. five witnesses. <laughs> we had to start all over again. Great, great, you know? great. So but it all came now, back full circle. Yeah, you know, uh, they, they were looking at me. Well, what the fuck is with this guy? <laughs> you know? Man, I love the stories, man. We gotta, we're going to have to do another episode Definitely. with you on, man. This was Lenny, great. Lenny, it was, was great, great being on your show, your podcast. You made me feel at ease. I tell you the stories. Very good. Listen, I'd definitely like to come back. I'm, I'm glad that I was able to do that. I really love the stories. I just like the way everything f- flowed. I knew it was going to be like that. I can't wait for future interviews with you and opportunities to link up with definitely. you. Definitely. And um, if you just want to promote your book, any other outlets that, that people well, can find you. It's definitely on Amazon, which is the biggest outlet. It's on Apple TV as the show and on Amazon. But it's Amazon.com. It's Street Warrior, uh, the book. And it's Street Justice, the Bronx. And uh, I brought a lot of partners and uh, bosses on the show with me. We dug them up from 40 years ago. Great, great. And uh, they came on and did comments and commentary. Okay. A lot of friends. It's really good. If anyone can catch it, go right on Amazon.com. And uh, I hope everybody watches this show. It was a great podcast. Oh, they will. I'm I'm sure Uh, they will. I'm sure they will. And thank you, it's been, thank you for having me on. Lee. Absolutely. You're a great host. Made me feel comfortable. Tell the story. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I feel I can open up to you, you know? All right, cool. And thanks for supporting law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Now, everybody, we're about to sign off. If you want to follow us, you can follow us on Finance United once again. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Please like, subscribe, and show your support. Leave a review. Ralph. Thanks once again. Thank you, Lenny. All right. This is Lenny Bradley signing off, Finance United Podcast.